Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final Aircode event today. I'd like to uh, welcome you to three hours of an exciting project. My name is Johannes Öffner. I'm the team leader of the team Maritime Technologies and Biomedics of the Fraunhofer CML in Hamburg. And I'm also the project coordinator of Aircode. And I'm your host today. Next slide, please. So this is our agenda for today. Initially, we planned it to be an in-person event at the o OI in London. But however, due to the pandemic, we had to go virtually. So um, with this, we also uh, slimmed down our um, agenda a little bit uh, to fit everything within a nice, uh, compact three-hour event. So first of all, we'll start with, um, after my talk, we'll start with, with a talk on the bio, on the bio inspiration um, of the entire project, how we got from the nature to uh, the ship. Then there will be a session um, led by my dear colleague, Jonathan, um, on the innovation and research of the project. We'll have four different talks um, on four different sections, and we'll end with a Q&A session. Um, there will be a coffee break after, all, after that, and then we will start with our second session on development and applications, again, with four different talks and led by Jonathan Weissheit. We'll finalize with our conclusion session, and afterwards, uh, I'd like to invite you as well to come and join us for a virtual networking session. Next slide, please. So um, just for your, to get used to how, uh, to today's event, um, this is a screenshot of the platform that you see. You probably, as you manage to log in, you've seen, you've already seen this. So you can um, see on the right, the presentation. Then there is a Q&A session, uh, a Q&A section where you can please uh, post any questions you have during the event to any talk or to the project in general, and we'll try and answer to that in the dedicated sessions or um, in the chat itself. And then on the left side, you can see there are a few tabs to open um, the plenary as it is at the moment. There's the agenda. There's uh, information about the speakers and information about the partners of the project and also the button to connect to the networking session. And on the, on the bottom, you can see a resource tab where you can find information on the project, uh, a few videos and some uh, documents. Next slide, please. So first of all, I'd like to introduce the project a little bit um, and give some details around the project. Next slide, please. So um, the project was funded in 2018 in the 2017 Horizon uh, 2020 call, so funded by the European Commission in the call um, MG21 2017, Innovations for Energy Efficiency and Emission Control and Waterborne Transport. It was planned to uh, run for three years. We've extended it to four years, and we got about 5.3 million euros from the EU. We have 10 different partners of six different countries, Equo Biotech Group, Avery Dennison, uh, the University of Applied Science in Bremen, Danao Shipping, the Finnish Meteorological Institute, HSVA, KIT, uh, PPG, uh, Revolve, and the Fraunhofer CML. Next slide, please. So our um, general goal of the project is to develop a passive air lubrication technology inspired by the Sylvania effect. Next slide, please. So this is, these are some images of the Sylvania plant. Uh, it's a plant, a water fern that lives in the tropics normally and large mats on uh, rivers, as you can see in the left image. But the further you uh, zoom into uh, the surface of the plant, you can see it possesses a very interesting microstructure. This is um, combined with a special uh, chemical composition of the surface. This leads to the fact that the plant uh, will in initially uh, or instantly form an air layer once you emerge emerged in the water. And this uh, effect, the so-called Cilinia effect, we, we wanted to make use of. Next slide, please. So we're using this effect and applying it on a technical surface. Um, of course, by doing so, we had to simplify it a little, modify it a little bit, 
but in the end, uh, our goal was to um, attach it or to uh, apply it on the microstructures based on a self-adhesive foil system, which can then be applied on ship hulls in order to do the same as the plant form a passive air layer. Next slide. And the benefits of our projects of, or of air code of the technologies are twofold. On the one hand, it's a passive air lubrication technology. So it reduces friction, uh, which leads and reduced energy use and reduced fuel costs. But on the other hand, by introducing a layer of air between the ship and the water, it, the water is supposed to not be able to touch the ship. So this leads to reduced biofouling, reduced corrosion, reduced biocides, and reduced noise emissions. And all of this reduces the emission, increases fuel efficiency, and increases sustainability. Furthermore, AirCoat is a refit technology which has no application limits. Next slide, please. So now I want to establish a little bit on the project st structure. Um, here it's important to understand uh, what special is in this project is that each partner worked uh, this work towards the same goal. So together we try to develop this um, air lubrication technology and different to other research projects where each partner has an, has an own goal. Um, here we really had to work together and we managed by doing um, uh, yeah, to working together in a, a specialized setup. We call this a multi-step innovation process, which we um, developed at the start of the project. Initially planned to uh, three years, we extended it to four years because uh, with this setup, any kind of delay will affect uh, all the others and delays will appear. So with the pandemic, which kind of affected us uh, quite a lot because uh, we had restricted access to laboratories, we couldn't travel. Um, others were affected as well, so we ended up um, extending the project to four years. But nevertheless, um, we, we managed. We have um, three different scales, small scale, large scale, and full scale. And all of them work together. Each um, piece feeds into the next one to realize the final goal of an air coach ship sailing the ocean, um, saving money and uh, reducing emissions. And during this project, it was always planned that this um, will happen after the project because it's out of the scope. It was out of the scope and budget to code an entire ship, for example. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to now elaborate a little bit the different phases. So in small scale, uh, in the small scale phase, we manufactured prototypes. We did a lots of different experiments and laboratories on friction and fouling. Also, of course, outside in the field, fouling experiments. And we did quite a um, comprehensive numerical simulation to understand the effect. Next slide. Then for large scale, uh, we manufactured industrial application pilots. Um, we did really large scale near operational experiments, which you will learn later, uh, learn more about later, later on. And we did some operational demonstration on container ships. Last, uh, next slide, please. And then to uh, come to the full scale uh, phase, we took all the results uh, from the previous phases and fed them into a virtual full scale validation. We did numerical simulation with CFD um, to fully code, uh, vir uh, virtually fully code and ship with air code and to see uh, what are the uh, potentials, what is the economic potential. And furthermore, we did some ship emission modeling, applying it virtually on the, on the entire fleet to see what's the environmental potential of this product. Next slide, please. And as I said, uh, all of this has only been done uh, with everyone together. We had a great team. Um, all people shown in this slide have been directly working on the project, but there have been more. There have been a lot of students involved, administrative people, and so on. So I'd like to thank everyone already. And next slide, please. And with this, I'd like to close my first introduction talk. 
and hand over the floor to Professor Dr. Thomas Schimmel from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, who is also the, the scientific manager of our project and who will give a talk today on the bio-inspired solution from the plant to the ship. Thomas, the floor is yours. Johannes, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Thomas Schimmel. I'm the director of the uh, Institute of Applied Physics at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. And as mentioned, I'm the, also the scientific coordinator of the AirCode project. In my group in Karlsruhe, air retention technology was initiated and artificial air retaining surfaces are developed and fabricated. From the first, small permanently air retaining surfaces of early days to the kilometers of advanced air retaining foils we produce today. I would like to invite you today to join a thrilling journey from the first beginnings to the current state of technology and the perspectives of the, for the future. It all began with a plant, as Johannes already mentioned, and with a, with a meeting between a biologist and a physicist I invited Professor, the well-known botanist, Professor Wilhelm Bartlott for a talk. And when we discussed, he said, well, there is an interesting phenomenon. There is a plant who keeps a, which keeps a permanent layer of air on the water. And it is not really understood how this works. You're a physicist, he said to me. Would you have a look at it? Maybe you can find out. That was the beginning of a great collaboration and we did find out. And I want to show you the way from biology to technology, bio-inspired solutions from the plant to the ship. In the next slide, you see in the following slide, you see the plant. It's a fern floating on the water surface, breathing air, but when it's drowned, uh, it's not suffocated underwater but it takes its own air layer underwater. How it works, you see a little bit on this photo. You see the leaf is covered with hairs, which are not small, which in this case are one, two, three millimeters high. And the hairs are coated by a lotus type surface. So they are extremely water repellent due to a nanotechnologically coated surface. The hairs are coated. And so when you put a droplet of water, as you see in the picture, the water does not the plant leave, but it stands on the top of the highly water repellent super hydrophobic hairs. In the next slide, you see it even more clearly. You will see on the right hand side uh, at a larger magnification, the individual hairs. They are shaped like egg beaters used in the kitchen. They are super hydrophobic and the leaf is standing on the hairs. Well, we copied this trick and it worked immediately for one minute or two or three. Our surfaces kept a layer of air on the water and then hair bubbles came out. They never came out from the plant, but they came out from our copy of the plant. So what happened? We found out that this plant has a second trick. While the hairs are strongly water repellent, super hydrophobic, the end of the hairs, the tips of the hairs, they are hydrophilic. They attract the water. And now you see what happens. When the water wants to penetrate, it is repelled by the hairs. When underwater air bubbles want to go out, they cannot go out because the water is glued in inverted commas, is attached to the pins to the ends of the hairs. So the air is trapped, the water cannot come in, the air cannot come out. We copied that and it works perfectly. In the next picture you see on the next slide, uh, the schematic drawing, uh, the pillars of the hairs keep a tent of air on the water like the pillars of a tent keep a tent. The water cannot come in, the air cannot come out, the air is trapped. In the next slide, you see a copy which we made from the, in the following slide, yes, uh, of 
one of our first artificial structures we made at KIT. The complex hairs are now simple pillars, but the effect is the same. The droplet of water is standing on the top of the pillars and the surface underneath remains dry. In the following picture, you see what happens when you drown that underwater. And you see that the polymer surface, which we now put into the water, it's completely black. But underwater, it has a silvery appearance. The silvery appearance is the reflection of the light due to the air layer. An air layer underwater is reflecting the light. So everything which is air coating, once you put it underwater, looks like silver coated. Once you take it out, it's black again. In the next slide, you see another example. We have a comb of air underwater. We have a black polymer again. We did not structure the entire surface, but we structure areas in the form of a comb. And you see the polymer itself is not air retaining, only where the structure is made, which we made in form of a comb, the pattern surface, this is air retaining. And if you ask the question, how long does that prevail on the water? You see the next uh, slide where you see um, air retaining surfaces where the red arrows are on the otherwise black samples. They are shining silvery underwater. But the interesting thing is, uh, if we wait a little bit for a couple of weeks or months, uh, the air layer is remaining. And in this, this photo, you see an intact permanent air layer, even after approximately five years, half a decade dry underwater. They are for half a decade underwater and they, the surface never was wet. It was permanently covered with an air layer. And the interesting thing is uh, the air is diffusing in and out. There's a permanent equilibrium between the air dissolved in the water and the air layer. And if part of the air is lost, it is restored from the air uh, dissolved in the water. So we have a permanent life of the air layer uh, on these samples in the lab. Next slide, please. Here you see an example where a blue polymer, which we fabricated at KIT, we immerse it into water. You see it immediately becomes silvery when immersed underwater. In the next slide you see dipping it deeper into the water and you see it, what is Drowned in the water is silver. What is out of the water is blue. We put it out in the next slide and put it in in the following slide. And you see it becomes silvery underwater, blue out of the water. You can very easily see that an air layer is there. In the following slide, you see what happened. Um, at a closer view, you see that these air layers are divided into compartments. That's a special trick we use to avoid shifting the air layer from one place to the other. So each of the air compartments basically is a ball bearing made of air. There are fascinating perspectives. Ships sliding in a hull of air, the fascinating perspectives of a new emerging technology, lubricating with a layer of air. Air has a much lower viscosity than water, so the ship is sliding in an air in a layer of air. That's our goal. But it's not the only advantage. Of course, you could expect fouling prevention as microorganisms cannot grow on a surface of air. They need some kind of solid surface. Of course, if the ship never touches the salty sea water, it is also a kind of corrosion protection. And finally, you would avoid toxic release. If a ship is, uh, has a toxic paint, the toxicity is not damaging the maritime environment because the ship is coated with a layer of air. Fascinating perspectives. And in the next slide, you see what happened. In fact, we got the validation award from the federal ministry in Germany. Um, it was even the first prize. Here you see the happy winners. Uh, but for me, it was also a very important point because this meant that uh, an independent board of experts decided 
that this would be the number one technology they would support. So they saw an independent board of experts saw the potential of the technology. Yet that was not the end, it was just the beginning. Next slide, please. Now we were from the plant to the lab. Now we want to go from the lab samples to the ship. The fascinating progress of a new technology I will show in the following slides. Next slide, you see um, the first step we had to take. Of course, from the centimeter scale samples in the lab, we would to have to go to large scale samples for the ship. And in fact, in our uh, production, we developed new processes to go from the centimeter scale, meanwhile, to the kilometer scale of our foils with a novel roll to roll process we developed at KIT. In the following slide, you see uh, part of these kilometer sized samples coming from roll to roll, hanging in the lab. But maybe the more important thing is not becoming large, but becoming small. We got from the centimeter to the kilometers with our foils, but we got from the millimeter to the micrometer scale with the structures on the surface. We got larger and larger with the foils, smaller and smaller with the structures. Why? Well, if uh, the foils and the air layer should withstand higher water pressures, the structures have to put be put more densely on the surface. The distance between the structures has to be smaller and the structures themselves have to be smaller. So we went to the kilometer scale with the samples to the micrometer scale with the structures, as you see in the following slide. Here you see the micro pillars uh, keeping the air layer underwater, but uh, becoming small with the structures is not the only thing. In the following slide, you see three other advantages what we developed now concerning the material. From the original stiff, brittle samples of the early days, we moved to highly elastic foils. From fouling materials, we moved to fouling release materials. And finally, now we are on our step from the lab test to the ocean. In the following slide, you will see uh, the boat we had at ABT in Malta. This 10 meter boat on the bottom side is covered with air retaining foil. We made our first tour, came back at the end of the day happily because what we see, what we made us happy was under the water surface. On the right hand side, you see the bottom of the boat and you see the black stripes, that's where there is no uh, structure keeping the air. And you see the silvery tiles. These would also be black, but they are not black, but silvery, because they kept the air underwater on this boat, and the boat returned with an intact air lay underwater. The next step is on the next slide. You see uh, the container ship at uh, of Danaos in Romania, where we uh, applied a large test area and we are curious what will happen. So we are on our way from the lab to the ship. And with this, I would like to conclude in the following slide. You saw our way from biology to technology, biologic bio-inspired air retaining surfaces, our way from an interesting plant to an emerging technology which has the potential to become a game-changing technology. You saw tremendous progress which was achieved from the centimeter scale to the kilometer scale with structures, billions and billions of structures fabricated from the sub-millimeter scale now to the micrometer structures. And finally, using different materials, using high elastic anti-fouling, high elastic fouling release materials. You see, big steps have been made. More will have to follow to implement our technology on the oceans of the world, saving natural resources, costs and CO2, and preserving our maritime environment. I would like to invite you today 
to inspiring talks on a bio-inspired technology. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I would like to hand over to Jonathan Weisheit from the CML. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much, Johannes. That was the introduction to the AirCode project and also the opening of the AirCode final event. Hi and welcome from my side. I'm very happy that you're here with us today. We have, as you might have seen from the agenda, a packed program. We have lots of information we would like to share with you. And as you might have noticed, we have two sessions planned. One session, it started just now. And the other session will start about 11.30. And each session uh, is, will include two parts. So the first part will be that we see some presentation from partners of the Airco project. They will present some results. They will give a little insight from their perspective of the Airco project. They will share some details from their field of expertise. And after these presentations, we will answer your questions. We will discuss whatever you comes to your mind. Well, if anything pops in your head or you have a question, like mentioned before, you can use the chat function. You will find the chat on the left-hand side from the video screen. If you cannot see it, it might be collapsed. So click on the little speech bubble and the chat will unfold. We will be happy to answer any question that you have. But before we get into the presentation in session one, we will have a look at the or uh, my personal highlight of the Echo project. That was the RV application that happened last summer. We have a video prepared that we would like to share with you. So sit back and enjoy. Reducing ship coating. In the project, we are aiming to coat a ship hull with a layer of air. This air layer should reduce the friction of the ship, making the ship glide through water. And to realize it, we are using an inspiration from nature. We are intending to mimic the so called Salvinia effect on a self adhesive fall system, which we then coat on the ship hull. The Salvinia effect gets its name from the water fern Salvinia, which has a special ability. On top of its surface, it possesses a number of tiny microstructures, which are covered in a specialized coating. This leads to the fact that once a Salvinia plant is submerged in water, it automatically forms a passive area. Biomimetics or bioinspiration is the transfer of biological models into technical applications by mimicking working principles of nature. The Salvinia effect has many facets. Most important is the microstructure. So in the technological application, we try to mimic this. We make very small structures and we make hydrophobic material. There is another thing which is in nature. We have a very thin layer of air and this very thin layer provides a very good stability against pressure fluctuations. And that we call the air spring effect. And we implement this in our product. The production of the air coat foil is done at KIT in our lab. We developed a process where we put a molten thermoplast on a roll and this roll takes up this molten layer and it's peeled off after it's cooled down. Then we cover it with a protection layer. And this protection layer here is, is a soft material you can see here. We produce this in a continuous way so that we can make many square meters with very small structures. The material itself has not only to be hydrophobic and moldable, it also has to be anti fouling So it has to be a material which is not liked by the organisms in the water. This is Gypsy Lee. This is Aquabiotech Group's research vessel, and we use it for a variety of marine projects, everything around the Maltese Islands. 
Today marks a very special milestone for the Aircoat project. As you can see on the back, we have started applying the Aircoat foil. The boat has been prepared by applying normal primer. And today, as the first day of the official coating application, we have Danny applying the first Aircoat foil samples on the boat. On place un film Aircoat. C'est un film, on va dire, qui remplace un peu l'anti-fouling. Et ici, c'est une évolution qui va permettre de, de moins, on va dire, consommer et euh, qui va évidemment permettre une meilleure glisse sur l'eau. Sur ici, on a terminé tout le flanc. Alors après, on, va, on termine l'arrière aussi. Cet espacement et l'espacement se, se comble par le primaire et par le top coat. Et ça va en fait rendre entièrement hermétique euh, ce côté-là du bateau en tout cas. For the last three years, we have been testing different prototypes and optimizing the air coat foil until the final product that we're testing here today. And we're really looking forward to Friday when we will finally be putting the first air coat foil in the water on a real vessel. Today is a big day. We finally finished removing the silicone protective layer from the air coat foil. This is actually the last strip. And we are now ready to deploy the boat. On the one hand, the passive air layer reduces the friction, which eventually would lead to less energy use and less ship emissions. On the other hand, by introducing an air layer between the water and the ship hull, we could prevent fouling as microfoulers can't get to the ship hull. Furthermore, this physical barrier would dampen ship noise emission as well as corrosion and release of biocides of underlying coatings. After a very busy week, the experiment is now over. We couldn't be happier. We saw 100% of air layer cover throughout the whole hull of the boat. Now that you got a little idea of what air code looks like, how it works, we want to dive a little deeper. We have four presentations for you. We have four speakers from different partners. And Stefan Walheim from KIT will continue what Thomas Schimmel already started. He will tell us more about the innovative structure and the production process. This is followed by Marina Beltri from Aqua Biotech Group. She will uh, present some results for marina trails and she will tell us how air coat can be used for fouling prevention. After that, we're going to take a look at a theoretical site. Albert Bass from Hochschule Bremen will present the outcomes of the CFD, CFD, result, uh, CFD simulations that were done by his, him and his, his team. And then we will take a look at physical experiments. Johannes Öffner from Fraunhofer CML will present results from the different approaches that we tried within the project to have a better look at the friction reduction or drag reduction effect of the air coat foil. So I will not longer speak. I will hand over the microphone to Stefan Walheim. So thank you, Jonathan, for introduction. So today I will talk about the, the making of, so to say, of the structures and uh, how we, we produce this large area of microstructured area. This is, was a long journey from very small samples to, to rather big ones, we, as you, you already have heard and you will see further. So next slide, please. 
Yes, here you see an uh, early example of our uh, structure, which was a rather crude structure. It has a diameter, the needles you can see here have a diameter of one millimeter. So it's a model structure, which was already hydrophobic and which mimics the structure of the Salvinia plant, uh, which you see on the right side. So this droplet of water is repelled by the structure and you can see that this, uh, even these very big structures are not uh, wetted, so-called wetted by the water. They are repelling the water. And this is the effect we want to have on the, on the final product. Next slide, please. So to introduce a little bit of the story why we want to go to such small structures, I will explain now uh, why this is necessary. So if you imagine you go deep into the water, uh, then the water pressure will press the water into the structure. And this is an, is an equilibrium uh, state. So that means uh, even if you are able to put a lot of air into the structure, with time this will diffuse out this air and the water will go in anyway. But there is a force against this, and this is the contact angle of the, of the water, so-called water contact angle. This is the tendency to repel the water. And this uh, is an interplay now between the structure size and this contact angle, which makes this the air layer stable. And to reach this equilibrium, we have to narrow uh, the distance between the pillars, as you see in this picture. All these three uh, cases, which you can see, uh, have the same um, curvature, but the bigger structure are not able to keep the air uh, stable inside. That means as deeper we want to go, as smaller the structure has to be. The second point is the material. It has to be hydrophobic, I already said, and this hydrophobicity is important and we have to realize it at the end of the, of the process. So the material has to be very hydrophobic. Then the structure has to be producible, of course, so it has to be mechanical stable, so we can produce it, we can unmold it, uh, we can put it on the ship and so on. So these are pra practical problems we have to solve. And then for the efficiency of the drag reduction, we need to have the structure, uh, we need a certain amount of air. If we reduce it to zero, then there is no effect. So we have a certain volume of air, which means we have a certain height of the structure to make it uh, functional. And we also need a small contact area. So we have only a few holes in the ship, does not bring anything. We need a large area of air compared to the contact uh, area of the structure with the water. So these are the four most important things we have to know. And I tried now to explain how we reach that. So next slide, please. So this is a picture of an electron microscope of the structure we can obtain by lithography. By lithography is a technique we use. It's a laser lithography we use uh, together with the people from the Karlsruhe Nano Microfabrication Facility at Karlsruhe to produce large area of the structure, like six by six centimeter, which is quite big because we have already small structures here. Next uh, uh, click, yes, you, hear, you see a zoom into that structure. And these are already structures which have a size of about 10 micron in diameter. So it's very beautiful and nice. And so it comes from the, from the clean room facility uh, of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And then we have to mold and, and continue the process. Next slide, please. So here you see the family of structures we made and the structure you just have seen is the biggest one uh, on that screen. And we, we continue to make the structure smaller and smaller to make it more resistance against, uh, resistant against pressure, water pressure. Next slide, please. Here you see the molding process from the direct laser writing. We get the position A, and then we can mold this and, and replicate it with, for example, epoxy resin, which is the transparent sample in the middle. And then we again can replicate and replicate uh, the structure. Next slide, please. Here you see now a, an epoxy sample from this big structure. And you see if you, if you scratch it or you, you press on it, it can, it's brittle, it can break. And so that's not the aim we have. We want to have a flexible material. So this the epoxy sample is very accurate and nice, but it has not the, the right mechanical property. Next slide, please. 
Here you see now a picture of a, and a presentation of a sample which was already big. It's 25 by 25 centimeters. So we scaled up the system and this is a soft material. A soft material which is also able to keep the air which you see in the lower picture. So if you put it under water you see the shining light of the, of the air layer. Next uh, slide please. So in in the course of the process, we had to put this on a large area and to smaller structures. And here you see a comparison between two models we have made. And you already see it, how, uh, see, you can see how we reduce the size. Next slide, please. Here is now the, the, the roll to roll machine in the background. And you see the foil hanging from the ceiling. That was more or less the first sample we made in this large area. And the machine we produced, next slide, please. To make this is this. So we need an extrusion machine which produces a, a, a soft material, a molten thermoplast, which is poured on the on the mold, and then it is rolled off when it's cooled down. And this band of materials then covered by another uh, protecting material. Next slide, please. Here you see now this uh, this cover. Uh, the green cover material which protects the structure and which we use then uh, for the uh, for the further processing you will see this in other in other presentation later on the, how important this coverage was next step here you see now the negative of the foil. So now the foil has instead of the pillars, it has holes. And this was important to, uh, to introduce the process for the negative foil, which then produce a positive product made by Avery Dennison at the end of the project. You see on the upper right side, the air retention of this positive structure, which is made then on, of a soft material. And the material we produce on the machine is the, in that case, the black band which you can see on the bottom. This uh, black band can also be made from transparent uh, material which we actually use then for the process. The black we usually use for the positive structure. We want to see the air layer. You also will see further examples of this black uh, material in, in further uh, presentations. Next step please. So in conclusion I can uh, now say that we, we produced a variety of structures. I didn't go into many details here, but we did a lot of different structures from one millimeter down to 2.5 micrometer. Not only what I've shown, also other models and variations of that. You will also see examples in the later presentations. Uh, for the large area, which means the large foil production, we made this uh, transparent foil, which you have seen, and the black foil in a positive manner up to 250 square meter of that. This is uh, more than a kilometer of this band. And we made them uh, for the further testings and applied them uh, with the help of the partners on the, on the vessel and on other test objects. For example, the HUCAT in Hamburg, which is a, a large facility, which you will also see pictures from. As a negative foil, we produce 17 square meter of this micro pillar structure, which is then applied to the, was applied to the container ship and is actually in the moment uh, in, the, in testing in the open sea. So with this, I conclude and I'm open for questions uh, if you have any. Thank you very much. Next speaker will be Marina Beltri from Aqua Biotech Group, and she will talk about uh, the fouling trials and also the, the trial in, in the uh, research vessel application, which we actually did together there on, on the island of Malta. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Stefan. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, as Stefan said, uh, this presentation will focus on two main topics. I will present an overview of the marina trials that we performed in Malta and the first results, thank you, and the first results that we got from there, as well as an overview of the lab experiments we performed for fouling prevention analysis. Next slide, please. Um, so we will start with the marina trials. Next. So as you have seen in the video, one of the milestones of the air code project was actually to coat a real vessel with the air code foil. And this was done on ABT's research vessel, which is called Gypsy Lee. And you can see here in the pictures, this vessel is 11 meters and is a, it has a fiberglass hull. Now you can see here in the pictures already some images from the dry dock 
uh, when it was lifted in the water and already here at the bottom with the green primer that we applied on the hull ready to receive the airco foil next slide please so here once the vessel was prepared with the primer we had a specialized applicator to apply the air coat foil. As you can see, the foil was actually protected with a red silicone layer. Um, this silicone layer helps protect the air coat foil from external agents prior to deployment. So when the vessel was um, fully coated and was ready for deployment, we removed uh, this layer, which was very easily peeled off, as you can see, you saw in the video and you can see here in the picture. Next slide, please. Um, actually, prior to deployment, we also installed an underwater camera to be able to record the air layer on the air coat foil from the time of deployment. So as it was getting lowered directly in the water and all throughout navigation. And you can see here a small camera and also a small torch to ensure that there was a good illumination. Next slide, please. Here we can see the hull of Gypsy Lee. Actually, this picture was taken after navigating 30 minutes at three knots within the Grand Harbor of Valletta. You can clearly see in this picture a silvery shimmer, almost like a mirror behavior from the air coat foil. Um, and in this picture, you can also see the compartments that um, Stefan was showing in his, in his presentation earlier, where uh, in which the foil is divided. Next slide, please. Here we can see more images. Uh, these are recorded with the underwater camera that we installed. And here is uh, the, the area that the camera was recording at different time points. So we can see the initial air layer, which was at the time of deployment, and then after 30 minute increments. And in these pictures, we can clearly see how the air layer behaves almost like a mirror. So it is reflecting all the surfaces around it. And even after 150 minutes, uh, the last picture, um, when the vessel had been navigating at seven knots for 30 minutes, we can clearly see that uh, the air layer is still there. Next slide, please. Um, so overall, we considered the Marina trial to be a very successful one. Um, we were able to validate the air coat foil application on a real seagoing vessel, which uh, was a first. Um, and actually, one of the matters that we were a bit unsure about was um, how the air coat foil would behave throughout the whole operation of lowering of the vessel. And if the foil would get damaged, uh, for example, uh, by the crane straps. But we were very happy to confirm that it was not the case and that the straps did not have any effect or any other external factors had any effect on the air layer integrity. Uh, finally, so we observed a full air layer after deployment, as well as after navigation within the harbor at three knots. And then at the end of the day, we could still see a full air layer for at least 70% of the hull. Um, and that was after navigating at seven knots. Next slide, please. Now we move on to the lab experiments, which we carried out to assess the anti-fouling properties of the air coat foil. So in the lab, we carried out attachment inhibition tests. The goal of these tests is to assess the behavior of the different microfouling species to the air coat foil and the subsequent air layer. So these tests were conducted with different set point durations. So we carried tests of four hours, 72 hours, and up to one week. Um, we developed the whole test procedure and the assessment to tailor for the assessment of the air layer and the particulars of the air coat foil. We tested with different air code prototypes, different sizes um, that you saw again in Stefan's presentation. And we also tested with four species of diatoms that you can see here on the right. Um, they are different sizes, they are different shapes. So we were sure that we could assess all the different attachment strategies of uh, this type of microfouling. Next slide, please. So here we can see the results of the microfouling experiments. So what you see here on the left is the air coat foil as seen with the microscope. So the little round dots are the pillars as seen from above. And um, what we can observe in these pictures is the fact that when an air layer is present, such as the picture on the left, there are no diatoms that have attached. On the other hand, the picture on, on the middle, there, is, there has been a water break. So this means that the air layer is no longer there. And we can see that the number of diatoms is extremely high. And in fact, we can compare it to the flat surface. That's just the picture on the right. And we can see that the number of diatoms is very high on that one again. Next slide, please. 
The same can be seen in this air code sample. In this case, we are now looking at smaller structures, so smaller pillars and smaller little points. Um, we can observe the same phenomenon. When an air layer is present, there are no diatoms. When the air layer is broken or compromised, there has been a water break, such as the picture on the, in the middle. The number of diatoms is very high. And again, we compare it to a flat surface that has no anti-fouling properties on the right. Next slide, please. Here we can see similar images again. In this case, this is a different species of diatom, which in this case is smaller and it has a round shape. Again, we see that when the air layer is present, no diatoms are observed, but when the, once that air layer is broken, then the diatoms are able to colonize the surface. Next slide, please. So what did the lab experiments tell us? Um, well, first of all, we developed a method for evaluating the diatom attachment inhibition for the air coat foil. And uh, then we also observed and confirmed that when an air layer is present, there are no diatoms that can attach. So um, it's a very good attachment inhibition for microfouling. And this was a very promising result because uh, we intend to publish very soon. So hopefully you can read um, all of it in a scientific journal uh, soon, but it also encourages the research of the air layer as a potential environmentally friendly anti-fouling. And, um, and we're, we're very, very happy about these results. Next slide, please. And <laughs> here we will have, uh, well, thank you for your attention. And we have now next uh, Dr. Albert Bars from the University of Applied Sciences in Bremen. And he's going to be presenting the results from drug reduction and all computational fluid dynamics. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, a main objective of this project is uh, the reduction of uh, frictional drag force on ship hulls. Next slide. If a, if a fluid flows along a rigid surface, uh, that is the figure on the left side, um, then we have always a drag force that is uh, here shown in blue. And uh, this drag force, this results from the no-slip condition of the fluid at the surface and the viscosity of the fluid. If this force is related to the area where it's acting on, then we get the wall shear stress tau w, and that can be calculated by the viscosity times the velocity gradient normal to the wall at the wall. And later on, if we then uh, normalize it with uh, the dynamic pressure, then we get the friction coefficient, which is used also later on. In the past, there are a lot of attempts to reduce this friction coefficient or also the friction force. In this project, uh, we place a thin air layer between the wall and the water, that's the right figure, and that will get a reduction in wall shear stress and friction coefficient. And this results from the lower viscosity of the air in comparison to water. At ambient condition, that is a factor of 50. And then we can also quantify this and calculate a drag reduction dr and that is the friction factor without air layer minus the friction coefficient with air layer and uh, that's divided by the friction coefficient without air layer in this constellation with a pure air layer um, the air flows with water and especially in turbulent flows what we found around ships uh, such a layer gets unstable, then bubbles are formed and the layer disappears. That's why we need a surface structure. Next slide, please. On the left-hand side, we see a scheme of Salvinia molesta mentioned before. On the right-hand side, there's an abstraction with pillars and uh, always grooves in spanwise direction. And there you can see uh, at the interface between the structure and the water, uh, that we have there still uh, no slip condition. And in comparison to a pure air layer, this leads to a decrease in drag reduction in comparison to the pure air layer. So what we can see there is um, that the geometry of the structure 
but also the size of the structure has a big influence on uh, the height of drag reduction. Next slide. And therefore, the first goal is the investigation of the effect of geometry and size on frictional drag reduction in turbulent flow. And from that, we receive information then for the design of the surface structure. Within this project, we are not able to, um, to cover bigger ship hulls with uh, such uh, structured surfaces and then measure the drag reduction, but we will calculate it using um, computational fluid dynamics uh, and runs turbulence modeling. Therefore, we have to introduce in such a runs model the effect uh, of air retaining surfaces. And the last point is scaling of structures. Um, at the end, we have to determine the size of the structure. And that we will see later on that this depends on the Reynolds number and the length of the ship hull. Next slide. Yeah, let's start now with the effect of geometry and size on frictional drag. Next slide. This we investigated in fully developed turbulent channel flow using direct numerical simulation. That is another flow uh, than the ship, uh, the flow around the ship. And uh, but what happens direct at the at the surface that is quite similar. That's why this is possible. You see that the, the channel and the two walls with a surface structure, and we modeled it with. Um, uh, no slip condition where we have the water structure interface and uh, with a slip condition where there's an air water interface. Uh, we investigated different uh, structure geometries, sizes, but all of them have the same ratio of slip area referred to total area of 0 0.75 at two different friction Reynolds number 180 and 300. Next slide. Here we see the investigated uh, geometries. These are pillars, holes, grooves in streamwise direction, grooves in spanwise direction, and L plus indicates the size of the structure in volumes. Next slide. That is now a result. The drag reduction is plotted where the, the structure size in wall units. And what we can see is that the drag reduction increases with structure size and from grooves in spanwise direction via holes, pillars, and grooves in streamwise direction. What we can see as maximum drag reduction over 70%, that's quite high, but um, yeah, to ensure um, air retention, um, we were forced to uh, have much lower structure sizes, L plus of around 10, and then we can expect drag reductions of around 10%. Next slide. To get an impression what is, a, what is the effect of a structured surface on the turbulent flow, we have here a comparison left without structure, right with structure. And there you can see um, that we have a higher concentration of eddies on the right hand side. That means higher turbulent momentum transfer to the wall. That means that we have a reduction in um, uh, drag reduction, but at the same time, what we can see here, we have a slip velocity at the surface, and that leads to an increase in drag reduction. Next slide. That is now the second goal. We want to model the air retaining surfaces in runs. Next slide. We are also doing that uh, um, with fully developed thermal channel flow but using then the runs equation. And we consider the structure with uh, slip lengths in stream and spanwise direction. What we get from the direct numerical simulation shown before, and they are introduced into boundary conditions and wall function of the K omega SST model for low and high Reynolds application. Next slide. Yeah, that's the result, drag reduction plotted over friction Reynolds number. And we see that the drag reduction is decreasing with uh, the friction Reynolds number, but increasing with slip length in uh, streamwise direction and decreasing with slip length in spanwise direction. Next slide. Yeah, let's come to scaling of structures. Next slide. 
Yeah, we learned that the friction coefficient is a function of Reynolds number, the size of the structure and the structure geometry. And uh, if we take the definition of um, the structure size in wall units, and we can resolve it for the structure size with dimension, and then we can also introduce the friction coefficient. And in the table below, um, there's given, they are given in the last uh, columns structure size in micrometers for different ship types uh, and for a structured surface of pillars and a drag reduction of 10%. And then you can see that uh, the sizes are quite different uh, for a sailing yacht around 130 microns and for a container ship around 50 microns. Next slide. Yeah, here are some conclusions. And uh, with that, I would like to finish. Thank you very much for your attention. The next presentation will be given by Johannes Öffner, and he will talk about drag reduction uh, experiments. Thank you, Albert. Yes, so um, my talk will be on the experiment side. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the content of this presentation is as follows. So I'll first um, introduce the validation process that we have defined for our pro project. Then I will um, explain on the methods and on the results that we have had um, and uh, pay a focus on the near or operational experiments that were done at the HICAT at HSCA. Um, and finally, I will give some conclusions. So next slide, please. So in four years of a project, uh, a whole lot of experiments have been done um, for the hydrodynamic side. Um, and this is an overview of what has been done, I'm gonna only focus on a few of those. Next slide, please. So the project itself comes with a so-called validation challenge. Um, from the previous presentations we've already learned, we are creating a lot of micro structures and we want to apply them on something that uh, are the largest macro structures um, that humans have created, um, but it's quite difficult or unimpossible to basically um, measure the drag on a fully coated ship and then compare it uh, to a measurement with a um, with a non-coated uh, ship. So we basically had to come up with a um, experimental process. And next slide, please. That we called the so-called uh, multi-step validation process. So here you can see um, we operated on three different scales, small scale, large scale, and full scale. Full scale would be the final container ship. Um, which, as I, Albert already explained, uh, could only be validated uh, virtually. So this has been done on the middle part, the CFD um, simulations. Um, on the left side, you can see the different experiments that were done. They are basically increasing from top to bottom in scale. Uh, so in sample size, the samples get bigger, but also um, the Reynolds numbers uh, get bigger. So Reynolds number, um, fluid dynamic uh, similitude, means that um, from top to bottom, the um, experiments get closer to reality. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we're starting with the uh, first experiments, rheometers or viscosimeter experiments. They were done at very small Reynolds numbers. Um, the main conclusion of those uh, experiments were that um, we could measure drag reduction. Um, for our air code samples, but we had a uh, quite interesting difference in uh, drag reduction of structure sizes. So this again um, uh, yeah, agrees with, with our simulations. And on the lower left uh, image, you can see um, an image uh, of, of air code with quite large structures of a few um, hundred micrometers. And here, we could measure drag reductions of about 7.5 to 15%. And using the same setup for uh, our small structures of a couple of um, micrometers, we even uh, found a drag increase. So um, our result from these uh, experiment sets were that structure size defines a drag reduction. Next slide, please. Um, then we went into a different uh, flow channel that were um, that was built in this project. We wanted to investigate um, what Albert pre presented in his first slide, um, investigate the boundary layer effect 
of air code compared to a normal boundary layer that you can see on the um, top left uh, image there. So we um, use some laser uh, Doppler anomaly measurements and um, try to measure those uh, boundary layers. And um, what our result was that we could uh, replicate literature data on flat surfaces. However, we weren't able to measure um, the velocity profiles on air code because um, the setup didn't allow us to uh, have a constant air layer during the, the, the experiments. And um, on the right side, you can see a graph. Uh, the blue line here shows the oxygen situation that we, that we measured during our experiments. And basically, from the images below, you can see uh, with decreasing oxygen saturation, our air, air layer on top of the surface vanishes. So um, main conclusion of this experiment is that we have basically an air retention that depends on temperature and on oxygen saturation, and that we need to be able to um, yeah, control the oxygen saturation in, in our lab experiments. Next slide, please. Then we um, did larger tests in cavitation tanks, um, sample scales of about uh, half a square meter um, on flat plates. And here uh, we could control oxygen saturation, which is good. And you could already see on the lower left graph um, that we uh, resulted drag reductions of about 17 to 23%. Um, re repeating those um, measurements after going all the way up to four meter per second um, showed that drag reduction uh, is a little bit lower and only um, smaller values were achieved. So this um, showed us that something happened with the air layer. We know that it depletes over time, but also the quality seems to change over time and speed. Um, repeating measurements with oversaturated waters, as we realized um, this is important, showed even drag increases. So something is happening on the, on the air layer side as well with oversaturated waters. Um, next slide, please. Um, we, came, we went into a different uh, setup for friction tank experiments, even a larger um, sizes of samples now, um, and showed, uh, could see there that uh, we have a drag reduction of about 2.5%. 2 to 5%, um, but also we got some results of an increase in drag reduction. And this was quite interesting because in the end, uh, we realized that the uh, that we were never really clear if an air layer is existent or not. Um, this, the, the, the setup of, of um, this experiment of equipment didn't allow us to monitor. So our main result from this is that we clearly need to monitor our air layer during our experiments and that the air retention highly depends on air pressure depths and the material quality. Next slide, please. And this came up uh, to our final experiments in, in the large uh, HUCAT of HSVA, where we did two different um, sets of experiments. Once we coded a eight meter long torpedo top um, middle image. And uh, finally, in our last experiment, which we did um, in the previous uh, months, we coated the tunnel wall um, with a size of about 14 square meter air code patch. And this was quite an achievement because it's quite a lot of foil that has been produced. And um, with the sizes of structures that you've learned about, in this 14 square meter patch, we had about 4.4 billion microstructures attached. So and our um, results are, are quite interesting as well. Um, down below, you can see the graph. Uh, the green line basically shows um, the results of the air code foil compared to the black, um, the black dash dotted line, which is the ITTC friction uh, line, which gives us a comparison. Um, and what we can see here, at slower speed, basically, um, the drag reduction is, uh, or there is no drag reduction, but there's a drag increase. Um, so we get higher forces than for the ITTC line. And this is due to, um, to this, what you can see in the video now, which starts at the moment. Um, there's on top of the air code foil, 
there is this what we called um, superimposed air layer um, that creates and um, starts to dissolve when um, or shed away when we turn on the flow. And interestingly, it basically re re removes at about four or five uh, meter per second. Here we are at 3.5 meter per second. Now we are at four, basically everything is gone. Um, but still, we have silvery uh, shining um, uh, echoed falls. So our actual echoed layer is there, but this superimposed air is not there. Um, this brings us to our conclusion. Next slide, please. That um, the superimposed air increases the drag. Um, but once it's gone, basically after six to seven um, or eight meters per second, um, our um, echo foil reduces the drag and we could measure about 9%, which uh, is pretty in line with the simulation results. Um, another interesting fact shows in the blue line, which is basically um, the same setup with a degassed foil, so still air coat, um, but no air layer. And interestingly, this uh, result, we had the entire time a drag reduction of about 8 to 12 percent compared to, to the ITTC line. So um, it's, it gives us, it gives us a, a fallback situation once if if the air layer is gone at some stage, we still have about um, uh, eight, eight to twelve percent drag reduction. We can compare these results to, for example, uh, riblet experiments, and we can we could speculate that our um, that our structures function in a similar way. Um, but also, we can see that at higher speeds, air code still performs best. And this brings me to my final slide. Next slide, please. Our conclusions. So we could measure a drag reduction of about 10%. Um, the drag reduction depends highly on structure size, air layer quality, speed, and air retention. And the air retention is defined by a yeah, complex interplay of depth, material, pressure, temperature, but also on the oxygen saturation. And oxygen saturation is a key element. And this leads uh, to even uh, superimposed air layer that can infect um, the drag reduction or even increase the drag. Um, the degassed air code solution could be a fallback so, uh, solution. Um, however, there are a few more experiments to be done. Uh, refilling the air layer is something of, of high interest as well. Um, so there are a lot more uh, experiments that can be done to uh, validate all our hypotheses, and they need to be done in further large-scale experiments. And with this, I'm concluding and handing over to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you very much, uh, all the other speakers. I'm no longer alone here on that virtual stage. I say hello to Marina, Stefan, Albert, and Johannes. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. Hello. <laughs> So this is a quite experience here. Um, glad we all gathered here and we are willing and ready to answer questions. So if you in the audience have any questions, I will repeat myself. You can post questions in the chat. There are already some questions posted. We will get to them in just a second. But if anything comes up during the discussion or if you have some more questions about the question that might have not been answered sufficiently in your opinion, feel free to ask another question and uh, yeah, we will discuss it. We were happy to, to let you know how ACCORD works and our experience with it. So there was one question that is more of a general type. It was the question if these videos that you saw and the presentations that you saw will be available online later on. Yes, they will. The video of the RV in Malta is already available on YouTube and everything else will be prepared after this event is over and then will be available online. Okay, during the presentation of uh, Thomas, there was already a question by Tim Kröger. And Tim was uh, wondering if the hydrophobic treatment of the microstructure surface is not toxic at all. So Thomas mentioned the toxicity of the product. 
Um, maybe I can direct that question to Stefan and you can say something about the toxicity level of your product. Yeah, so I can say in the, in the materials we are using in the lab and, and for Marina, for the fouling tests, nothing is toxic at all. And the material which was deployed and um, deployed on the on the container ship, there uh, will be a presentation uh, in this next session, is from PPG, and this uh, standard fouling release material, uh, which is not toxic or very very low toxicity, which can be answered by uh, Ayan in the next session. But from our lab experiments, everything is not toxic at all. Okay, thank you, Stefan. I would like to repeat the question and maybe direct it to Marina. So Marina, you work with diatoms and other living beings. So is there anything you experienced with the toxicity of the product? Not at all, not at all. We were able to confirm that uh, both diatoms and other species that we tested in the lab had no effects uh, regarding toxicity. So that is confirmed, yes. Okay, I hope Tim, this answers your question. So no toxicity experienced. Then there was another question by Jan Xing Kidding. I hope I pronounced it correctly, sorry if not. Did you measure the power saving for the first trial on a vessel with airco foil? So I think he's referring to the research vessel and I would like to uh, ask Marina, since your company owns the boat, uh, did we measure the power saving? Um, we did not. Um, in fact, the goal of the tests was uh, mainly to validate the application procedure and also confirm the air retention properties of the air coat foil on a real seagoing vessel. So those were the two main um, objectives, but uh, we are hoping to continue our research with air coat and hopefully include these kind of measurements in future tests, for sure. Thank you, Marina. Uh, Johannes, is there yeah. something you would like to yeah. add here? I mean, it's uh, quite difficult as well to, I mean, we could measure power, but uh, how to measure the power savings uh, when we have an, uh, a ship coated with, with, with air coat, we, because we always need to have a control which uh, has no air coat to um, yeah, calculate the, the difference. And um, here comes in place our uh, simulations, uh, which um, I think can help here because uh, in, in a simulated environment, we can change in between an, a coated and a non-coated vessel with, with, the, um, with a sea trial. It's hard, quite difficult. Um, you could try and set up two um, ships I, with an identical and an identical setup, but it's, it's definitely a, a difficult one. So um, this is why we did our simulations as well as our near and large scale um, operational um, experiments in the laboratory where we can actually uh, set the environment to um, yeah, surroundings. Thank you, Johannes. Yes, indeed, this is really hard to, um, to say how large the drag reduction is. Uh, this brings us to our ne next question. The question was uh, is coming from Andrew Spittery. He is asking about the CFD simulation. So did you manage to scale up the drag reduction from CFD to full scale? I think Albert, you're the expert on that one. Maybe you can answer it. So what we did is uh, we developed a model, what we implemented in, uh, in, in run simulation, and we hopefully can, yeah? Um, what we see for results is that the drag reduction reduces with growing Reynolds number. And that is quite logic. That's something what we can explain. Mm -hmm. um, at the total end, yeah, we need a comparison with uh, experimental data, what is missing so far because uh, the effort is enormous. But hopefully we can. Thank you, Albert. There is another question to the drag reduction. I think you can um, now give an example with a little more um, boundary conditions. So there is a question by Jacob Norby. Uh, it's considering small structures for higher pressure and there is also the speed dependency on air retention. So he's asking what would your realistic approximate total power savings be? And here comes the kicker. He's asking for a ship about 10 meters draught and 30 knots speed. 
So do you have any example here that you might uh, can give us and say something about the realistic approximations? Yeah, that's not so easy for that because that's a very special case and we would have to investigate that. But what I can say in general is um, you must always consider we are talking about drag frictional drag reduction, not drag reduction in total. Yeah. Um, if we have a ship, we have different parts of uh, which contribute to drag forces. Yeah. And one of that part is uh, frictional drag. And that we, are, that we can work on. I cannot exclude that this part uh, yeah, has also influence on other yeah, parts of track, yeah? Um, but, um, and the second point is, um, do we assume that the whole ship is covered yeah, with uh, such, a, such a foil? That is the second thing. So it's, it's not so easy, that's not so easy to say. It will be lower than 10%, of course, no, because we have these other contributions, and if not all parts are covered, it will be also even lower. Thank you, Albert. Also, maybe we can add here that we have a further session where we actually, um, there will be some further talks on this, how we, um, yeah, what, what basically will be the effect uh, on, on fuel savings. So that will be done after lunch. Exactly. Well, we'll get to that after the coffee break and our second session. Um, I think I will refer the next question also to the next session. So Damien de Moore is asking about um, equipping a large vessel with the air coat foil. And he's wondering who can produce it, um, how he can equip his vessel with that foil. I think, uh, yeah, like I said, it's going to be a great question for the second session. I hope, Damien, you can wait for some more minutes. Um, and then I see there is one more question coming in from Christine Soiland. How long is the air retained in real seawater compared to clean lab water chests? So I think maybe, Stefan, you can go first. Uh, what is your experience with the uh, clean water lab? Um, clean water in the lab and then maybe after that Marina can do a comparison since she has done a lot of seawater experiments. Yes, in general the lab tests of course have a better uh, controllability and a temperature stability and therefore we expect for the structures we have shown uh, in, a, in, in the SEM pictures you have seen a stability of about one meter depth of many weeks and uh, in the seawater we had similar structures and marina you can tell what what you experienced there yeah so, so um, yeah you. maybe i can give another uh, hint the structures which thomas showed in his introduction we have many many tests with small structures and small uh, samples which hold the air forever so there are there is no limit but uh, as deeper you go and as bigger the scale is of the production uh, the lower the quality and of course we have to scale the process which makes uh, has technic technological development necessary so marina <laughs> thank you stefan um from our experience because we conducted um a lot of field work tests so we um we deployed different air code prototypes. So um, as we were optimizing the product, we kept um, immersing those samples in real seawater conditions in the Mediterranean. Um, we, we have observed an optimization also in the air retaining uh, properties of the sample. So of course, let's say at the beginning of the project, we were looking at a few days of air retention in real water conditions. Um, the latest samples, so the optimized samples that we received that were exposed um, offshore in Malta. We were looking at um, air layer retentions of about a month. Um, and that is subject to, to fouling, to waves, um, to different um, water saturation levels. So we were really taking into account all, you know, the, the whole array of uh, real conditions. 
Thank you, Marina. So there is a slight difference between lab tests and the seawater, but maybe Johannes, you can say something about lab tests and experiments. So there is quite a challenge. You already picked up the topic a little bit in your presentation. Maybe you can say something about the challenges we experienced during these tests. Yeah, so um, as I said before, um, a big challenge and we didn't actually, um, I, I don't know, maybe we did, but I think we didn't expect it to be such a big challenge as the, the oxygen saturation of the water. We realized that this is quite a key effect. Um, if, if it's not at 100%, if it's uh, lower or if it's higher, it affects, um, it's, it affects the, the, the layout of, of, of the, the air layer. So either it deflates or even it uh, adds these superimposed air layers on top. So um, in, in the real environment, it's, I mean, at least on the surface of, of, of the ocean, the oxygen saturation is, is normally uh, quite level at 100%. However, this, this changes um, due to seasons or locations and things like that. And no one has ever looked at it at this, ever looked at it uh, with this aspect of, of a passive air lubrication technology. So this would be something quite interesting to look at later on um, and, and follow up and follow up uh, activities. And then, um, yeah, for the lab environment, we realized, okay, we now we need to actually modify our equipment in a way that we can, um, yeah, that we can basically set a certain um, oxygen saturation. And this wasn't able to be done with all the equipment that we wanted to use. So we, we had to improvise and um, some of the experiments just couldn't have been done because the setup didn't allow allow that. Yeah. And I think um, KIT did also do quite a lot of work on this. Maybe you want to, Stefan, you want to elaborate as well? Yeah, maybe I can say something about the, the saturation. Saturation is not only oxygen, it's also the other gases gases which are dissolved in water. And so we do manage the saturation in our lab experiment. Uh, that's also the case for the Hucard experiment and the other experiments uh, with, which, is, uh, which were done at HSVR. And so the saturation of gas uh, dissolved in the water has to be um, yes, considered. And if you keep them at, the, let's say, 100%, then, uh, which means there is a good exchange with, uh, with the atmosphere, then at low level depths, uh, there is an infinite air layer stability. And if you increase it over 100%, that's uh, what Johannes uh, mentioned, then we have a superimposed air layer. We have bubbles of air uh, accumulating, which may also reduce the drag reduction or influence it, but at high speed, uh, we have seen that these air bubbles go away and, and we have a flat air layer again. But if the saturation is too low, and that also goes in the direction of the last question about the temperature effect by David uh, Chimines, uh, if the temperature increases, and uh, so the saturation is also increasing, uh, at a given uh, saturation because lo uh, colder water can take up more uh, air or gas than warmer water. So the change of temperature also um, influences the saturation. So we have always to consider this. And so temperature effects uh, may also change uh, the stability uh, in the real condition. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I would like uh, to ask Albert a question. So you're quite familiar with CFD experiments and you have uh, quite the opportunity to change the parameters of the structure sizes totally different to what uh, Stefan is doing in the lab when producing the foil. And I would like to know um, what is the difference between the different structure sizes? Uh, you don't have to keep in mind the, the water penetrating um, the, the structure as uh, Stefan does in his experiments. So what did you find out during your CFD simulations? Yeah, what we found out is that uh, drag reduction increases with increasing structure size. Um, and that, of course, depends at the same time on the geometry of the structure. 
um, you can say um, the longer uh, the slip length is or the in streamwise direction. So if you take grooves in streamwise direction, yeah, and you are yeah, on the interface water air, yeah, um, then there's then then there's then there's no drag anymore, yeah. Uh, without the size, there's coming an influence in it. But um, then you can get uh, really high drag reduction in comparison if you have grooves in uh, in spanwise direction, where you have from time to time a fluid a fluid element, yeah, uh, sees uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah a surface with a no slip uh, with a no slip condition, yeah, and so both the structure size and the geometry have really a big influence uh, on drag reduction, which can be achieved at the end. Thank you, Albert. Then there is the question about the experiments. So Johannes, you mentioned that there is a superimposed air layer and Philip Beveridge, he, he would like to know if you have any idea why there is suddenly an increase in friction with that superimposed air layer. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's definitely the air layer, the superimposed air layer is uh, sometimes still attached to the surface, at, especially at a low speed. And I guess this attachment um, has an effect. We are creating some waves. And um, although we know that, for example, um, uh, multi-bubble technology, um, you reduce uh, friction with uh, induced um, air, uh, with, in this case, uh, the, the 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 bubble size matters quite a lot, and here this was a side effect, so we didn't we didn't have an influence on the bubble size. Um, so I guess that's that's a reason. Maybe I can also forward this to Albert, who can give him a further insight on the fluid dynamic uh, side to this. Yeah, if you have a if you have an additional air layer on it, or you have additional parts of of, of airs, yeah. Uh, hanging at that at that surface, of course, um, you have also um, an area, yeah, which is uh, normal to the flow direction, yeah. And if fluid hits this area, you have at the same time uh, you have drag, yeah. And uh, especially um, if we are dealing with flat plates, and that was the case in that experiment, yeah. Um, all this are very uh, was such effects uh, uh, yeah, really um, have a have a big effect on the uh, on the drag? Yeah, only little things. Yeah, um, yeah, can in increase the drag and also such an superimposed air layer. Yeah. Thank you very much for clarifying. Then there is the question by. Oh boy, Nils Shikwari, sorry for that. Oh, Nils, don't feel offended. Um, how sensitive is the coating to mechanical impact? Stefan, what can you say about that? This is, of course, depending on uh, which kind of mechanical <laughs> destruction you want to do. So, of course, if the anchor chain uh, will hit this, the foil on uh, adhesive, uh, coated on the boat it can be it can damage but we are using now uh, soft materials especially in the container ship application we use the ppg uh, developed fouling release material which has which is a, a very soft uh, and bendable material and uh, there uh, if you don't uh, let's say scratch it it's it's flexible and but uh, of course if you scratch it and, and remove a part of it then of course there is no air retention anymore thank you stefan then again a question from Jan sing kerding he would like to know more about the cfd work so albert you mentioned modeling some microstructure with your dns simulation so and if it uses a slip wall boundary condition it indicates already no frictional deck in that area. Can you clarify that, please? Yeah, yeah, we have uh, indeed uh, a few approaches, yeah, to to model this effect. And uh, the most finest we have is a direct numerical simulation, 
with slip and no slip areas. So this is a flat surface, yeah. And um, where are the interfaces between um, uh, yeah, structure and, and water? There's a no slip condition. And where the, um, the water air interface, we have a, a slip condition. And um, the question may refer to that, to that point. Um, what we know so far is um, that the influence um, at the structure uh, water interface is so big yeah, um, that we can neglect the friction which appears um, at the air water interface. That's why it's a um, full uh, slip condition. Yeah. And that is also what we see um, from the results. Yeah. If we go up with a structure size or if we go down, yeah, um, that is quite a huge effect. And so we think um, that this is okay if we model that uh, yeah, in this form. Thank you, Albert. Uh, I would like to apologize to Jan. Uh, I just learned that you are a female and I refer to you as male, so sorry, no offense there. Um, I would like to add that I'm pretty sure if you have more detailed questions about the CFD simulations, feel free to contact Albert, send him an email, and maybe you can dive a little deeper in the whole topic. There is a question that I have for Marina. Um, so you were there when the RV boat was covered with the air coat foil, and I was wondering if the air coat foil is still intact and if the vessel is still running. Well, the vessel is still running, that's for sure. Um, unfortunately, the air layer is no longer there. So um, we coated in June. So it's been almost a year and the, the air layer is no longer there. But the air coat is still intact on the vessel. So um, um, even the, the application, so it proves that the application process, even the adhesive power of the air coat foil on the vessel worked perfectly fine as it is still fully covered. Thank you, Marina. And there is a question about monitoring the air layer. So, Johannes, you mentioned that during the experiments it was really difficult. We saw Marina diving around the RV uh, during this uh, RV application. Uh, what is the best way to monitor the air layer? Yep. Um, so, for air layer monitoring or quantification, we did even include an entire um, task and deliverable on this. So we, we've had a profound look into different uh, possibilities. So um, looking into acoustic, later piezoelectric um, capacity sensors, optical sensors, a lot uh, were, were looked at. Finally, we realized um, optical still works the best. Um, even simple photo or video cameras um, worked the best once we had our uh, structure uh, made up on a on a black um, material with the the big uh, difference of black and silvery shining air layer we could um, actually get the best results and then there were some um, automatic image analysis processes been done which uh, gave the most promising results um, however it's a it's a tricky uh, topic and it needs to be looked at Furthermore. Yeah, thank you, Johannes. And as you were mentioning different colors of the air coat foil, Stefan, is there any difference to the different colors of air coat foil? If you mean the material, different color of material, uh, it's just a pigment inside, not at the surface. So the material have a bulk property. They, they are not uh, coated at the very surface. So they have a bulk property. So the um, material itself uh, has, if you want to see the air layer, it's much better to have a black uh, foil because then you see a good contrast in air layer or no, no air layer. For example, the video which Johannes have shown from the Hucat experiment, you see areas which are black and they are actually the same material but without air layer. That are areas without structure uh, which stems from the production process, not already scaled uh, completely, uh, has some integer, uh, yes, some 
tiles uh, which, which it's consisting of. And so you see some, as a reference, you see some areas without structure. And here you see a very good color uh, contrast between air layer and no air layer. Thank you, Stefan. I can add to that from my own experience. It's much easier to see the air on a black air coat for than it is yeah. on that transparent material. Let's come back to the uh, air code in different depth and uh, how it works with the air retention. There is another question from Andrew. He would like to know um, our from our experience with uh, different depth and how it uh, affects the changes in drag. So maybe first Stefan can answer something about the air retention in different depth. And after that, uh, Albert can maybe conclude the answer by saying something about drag reduction and the dependency on depth. So for the experiment, of course, it's as I introduced, uh, it's of course important as deeper you want to go, as smaller the structure has to be. And for the drag reduction, this means that uh, the, the smaller structure, they uh, will have a less uh, perfect uh, drag reduction because you have just more yeah, contact points per area, uh, maybe Albert can say something to that. So it's important if you want to go to deeper depths, you need smaller structures. And uh, and but the friction, and that means uh, in an indirect way that then the, the friction reduction will change. Yeah, um, of course, uh, if we want to could go to deeper de deeps and we need smaller structures and it happens what, what Stefan said, um, yeah, we get a lower drag reduction. That's a question of structure size. On the other hand, um, yeah, it depends a little bit now on the shape of the water air interface. Yeah, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's still a flat surface uh, um, with, with, a, with a structure, um, then um, we have we have no effect but uh, if the shape changes yeah if we um, get a shape like that here due to the increasing pressure yeah with with steeps and the um, water is is compressed of course then we get a rough surface and um, then it depends a little bit uh, uh, on the size of the of the roughness if we also can get uh, a drag increase, that depends. Yeah, if the air in that uh, in that uh, in that layer yeah, has the same pressure, yeah, then uh, what is the pressure at that at that water height? Yeah, we do not have this problem. Yeah, that's also a question of refilling at the end uh, in place. Thank you, so, Stefan. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of parameters. Yeah. There are a lot of parameters. It's a very complex topic. Um, I hope that uh, everybody in the audience got a little idea about it. If you want to learn more, you can, of course, contact Stefan or Albert, or you can read through our material and our uh, reports that we are posted online. We're almost over. We're almost done with that Q&A session. I hope that all questions were answered um, sufficiently. If not, feel free to answer more questions in, in the chat, uh, to send more questions. We will answer them, of course. <laughs> and then uh, we will have, of course, the opportunity later uh, after the second session during the other Q&A, and we will get back to, to the question by Damien de Moore. We're now going to have a little coffee break. Uh, we will freshen up for the next session, and you in the meantime can do the same thing. But you can also look around here on our platform and learn a little bit more about the project, or if you want to learn more about the speakers that you saw or you will see after the coffee break, feel free to click all the infos that we have here, learn about the partners within the project. Um, and I would like to say, Thank you to Marina, to Albert, to Stefan, and to Johannes for answering the question. I just saw that there is another question coming in from Elias Liebermann. Uh, we will, of course, answer that too. We will not forget about it. But right now, I would say this first session is over. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you for your interest. And we will be back after the coffee break at around 11.30. Welcome back, everybody. Coffee break is over. I hope you feel refreshed and you're ready for another session of the Aircode final event.
Uh, for everybody of you who expected now Daniela Mühlen to be here, I'm very sorry to let you down. She's also very sorry. She sends her regards. She cannot be with us here today um, for private reasons. I will do my very best uh, to, to represent her here and do the moderation of the Q&A session number two and also introduce the session number two. So session number two is about the development um, application. And as before, we have speakers from the project who will give some idea about the results, who will share their knowledge. And as before, we're going to have a look at a video that was already mentioned here. Uh, it's about the container vessel application. The ultimate goal of the ECHOD project is the perspective of protecting and lubricating ships by covering them with a layer of air underwater. We want to see how our ECHOD foil behaves on a real large container ship under real maritime conditions. Following the pre-treatment of the hull surface with blasting and high pressure fresh water cleaning, two layers of universal anti-corrosive epoxy primers applied. After allowing the necessary drying time, the aircoid foil patch attach on the substrate covering an area of 15 square meter approximately. The application of the aircoid foil was supported by scaffolding infrastructure in order to cause the applicator during his job. To secure the adhesion of the foil, a minimum substrate temperature of 15 Celsius degrees was necessary. We reached this minimum temperature with the aid of three heaters of 15 kilowatt capacity each, blowing hot air during the whole installation together with the tent sealed around the area in order to keep the warm conditions. The inspiration for our air coating technology, which we developed here in Karlsruhe, came from a plant. The floating water fern Sylvinia molester, which has fascinating properties. When we drown the leaves underwater, they keep a permanent layer of air underwater. The leaves can breathe underwater. In our artificial foils, we use tiny, specially designed pillars to perform the same task. For the aircoat foil, we chose to have a foundling release coating. A foundling release coating is an anti-founding coating without the biocides. The binder is a polysiloxane. It's a very, very flexible binding, binder, and it gives the properties to the coating itself. So it's very, very hydrophobic, and it is very flexible. So that means that if founding will grow to the surface, of a foundry coating, it will be easily washed off when the vessel is sailing or when it's too heavy, it uh, slides off pretty easily. For the application of the foil, we use our standard Simaglide 1290. There's a little difference in the manufacturing process at Evidensen and a real life application in the yard. In the yard, you apply at room temperature. In the manufacturing process at Evidensen, the, uh, the foil will go through an oven, which is about 120 degrees Celsius. And therefore, we had to tweak the formulation a little bit to adopt that fast curing time. Key difference is the uh, pillar structure. This very fine pillar uh, structure allows the uh, creation of a air layer at the top of um, the foil. And uh, this is really the unique feature of our system compared to the standard anti filing system in the market. For the good foil, we had to duplicate very tiny structure. And to do that, we had to adapt our processes. We adjusted the oven settings, machine speed, temperatures, such that we were able to produce the good foil. A number of stripes of the film attached to the hull, one next to the other, shaping a well-formed air coat patch. After that, we seal the edges, applying the proper edge sealing system and conclude with the installation. Now, to monitor the foil in service, a couple of underwater inspections are scheduled to spot for any air layer or check for marine growth or any possible damage to the foil. All data captured from installation, production and inspections will be very useful to assess the prototype against a number of performance criteria, such as time and cost of the installation of their code, 
waste produced or utilization of resources during the application, durability and adhesion of the foil in service, anti-fouling properties and of course air retention. The only critical challenge had to do with the cold wind in Romania where the dry dock took place and the low temperature by that time that was kind of risky for the progression of the adhesion of the foil. The large-scale experiments were many square meters of air retaining foil are mounted in a flow channel and exposed to realistic flow conditions. These experiments help us to further develop and improve the air coat foil and to learn how it behaves under practical conditions, especially at higher velocities, a key for performing the step from the lab to the ship. The experiments are still ongoing, but our recent experiments show air layer stability even under the harsh testing conditions of the large flow channel at the HSVA testing facility. And now we're looking forward to our container ship starting its long way over the seas. Welcome back. So after session one, which was about the lab production, lab experiments, we now want to step it up a notch and look at a larger accurate surfaces and larger production and looking at industry scale and also global fleet simulation. In session two, we again have speakers uh, from the Aircorp project. Uh, at first, I would like then to, to, to introduce Helene Gobri from Avery Dennison. She will tell us all about the industry foil production. And then Fotis Okunumu from Danaos, he will tell us more about the con container ship application that you just saw in the video. After that, we're going to take a look at perform performance prediction more from a theoretical side again. Nils Hagemeister from uh, Fraunhofer CML, he will present performance prediction with the CFD simulations that he did. And he will be followed by Yuka Pekka Yaikanen from the Meteorological Institute a Finnish Meteorological Institute, and he will present his results from the global fleet simulation to give a better idea of why it is important that all ships should be covered with the air code foil. But no longer from me, I will hand over to Helen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hélène Munkobri, Product Manager at Avery Dennison, a leader in the manufacture of uh, self-adhesive films. I will present today to you the piece of work we did in the Aircode project, which um, consisted in the production of the Aircode foil. Next. Um, so the aim of uh, Avery Dennison was to produce on an industrial scale a foil, um, which is a self-adhesive product that would display the following uh, key features. So first of all, um, it should have a silicon top layer with the right hydrophobicity, so we would have a filing release effect. Secondly, this um, silicon top layer should uh, be structured and um, the um, structure would be, should be that of um, mini pillars, uh, which we know allow the creation of an air layer uh, when immersed into water. And there I refer to the uh, Salvinia effect that the KIT presented um, earlier. And the third um, last uh, important characteristic of uh, the self-adhesive product was um, to achieve a um, sufficient adhesion onto a boat hull for a long-term application. So overall, we came up with a construction which is uh, displayed on the little graph um, shown here, uh, starting from um, a, a standard self-adhesive made of a career film um, coated at the back with an adhesive and uh, protected with a backing paper. And that self-adhesive was then coated with a silicon uh, layer, which uh, was then embossed thanks to a structured transparent protective sheet provided by the KIT. Next slide, please. So um, the 
choice of the, the self uh, uh, adhesive and more particularly the adhesive type um, was within the field of expertise of uh, Avery Dennison. And um, within our product range, we had some uh, very high tack and high bond adhesive that uh, were already used for burine application. So the choice of this adhesive was um, relatively straightforward. In terms of um, choice of silicon, we um, worked together with uh, PPG, uh, uh, the leader in the um, uh, marine and protective coatings, uh, and we've uh, definitely um, uh, followed their recommendation on the best silicon to be used for that particular um, application. Remained the challenging part, which was how to create um, the protective sheet with the uh, right embossing um, and the uh, reliable and precise replication of this mini uh, pillar structure was really the key uh, and the most challenging part of the whole process. Um, you have to know that um, starting from the lab scale up to the finished uh, good, which is the self adhesive, uh, air gold foil. We had uh, a minimum of eight different steps in which um, the pillar structure was going, uh, was being replicated uh, from a negative to positive, positive, negative several times. So we needed to ensure that the, the pillar structure was properly replicated. Um, you see in the different photos displayed here that. Um, the very initially we started from a, a, a tiny um, negative um, foil which was then um, replicated in positive to make this uh, red cylinder that you see on the third photo. This red cylinder was assembled onto an embossing cylinder which was used to make um, a PE protective sheet which is on the following photo in white. And that protective sheet was then used in the self-adhesive production process to emboss the um, uh, silicon top layer of our um, final product. Next slide, please. So to, to um, make this uh, air coat foil, we first worked with one of the pilot coater of Avery Dennison. Um, using a production sh uh, protective sheet that was 20 centimeter wide, because that was what had been produced on the lab scale by the KIT. Um, however, working with a pilot coater meant some setup limitations, which in the end created some um, hurdles in the product. So, for example, um, the pilot uh, line has less oven, which means that the silicon cross-linking was a little bit less good than what we could achieve normally on an industrial uh, scale um, coater. Um, as well, the uh, winding quality was a little bit lower, leading to falls in the end product. And also the, the quality of the coating was not always ideal. Um, so in order to have a product which was really up to our expectations, we had to go to full scale production and have there the optimal production uh, conditions. Next slide, please. So um, working with an industrial quota uh, means se several constraints. I will show you in a second uh, a picture of our machine, which is quite big. And one of the first requirements is that we have to have a raw material which are at least one meter wide and several hundreds meter long. So having only uh, tiny rolls of 20 centimeter wide from the KIT, um, we had to find a trick to make that wide enough. So. Uh, what we did in a preparatory step uh, was kind of patching together five different rows of uh, protective sheet with the uh, pillar structure. And we assembled them using a self-adhesive uh, of uh, the right size, that is to say 120 uh, centimeters, and which is displayed here as the green 
um, square. So all these protective sheets were assembled in order to have a wide protective sheet that we could use in the industrial quota. Next slide, please. Um, so as you can see here, our machine is uh, a quite big one. Um, it's as long as a football field. It has a series of oven which uh, can go up to 200 degrees. Um, the machine speed uh, can vary from a few meters per minute to a few hundreds of minutes. So many different um, parameters and but definitely wide scale. So uh, next slide, please. What did we do uh, during our trial with this uh, bigger machine? So we used the, um, uh, first of all, uh, we prepared the self-adhesive part. So that is to say the career with the adhesive and the backing paper in the first stage. And in the second stage, so a second machine pass, um, we coated the silicone uh, on top of the self-adhesive. And you can see on the, on the second picture, the start of the silicone uh, being coated in black. So that, uh, that uh, widens up and then goes up to the full width of the product. It's really the initial of the, of the production that you see here. Um, so uh, the, the silicone layer uh, was cast, dried into uh, the ovens, and at the end of the coating line, the protective sheet, which is backed up with the um, green uh, self-adhesive, was pressed onto the freshly cured silicon in order to emboss it and give the pillar structure to the silicon. Next slide, please. So the final product was um, obtained uh, using our standard machine, but playing with the different parameters, because of course, we had to adjust many different parameters uh, in order to achieve uh, a good replication of, our, uh, of the pillar structure. Um, you have to, to remember that the silicon is coated wet and it has to dry in the oven and be soft enough so that um, the protective sheet could emboss it. So this means that the temperature of the ovens had to be um, uh, adjusted, the, sp the speed of the project production line as well. And at the end of the production line, the machine, we had to uh, adjust the winding tension. But we achieved a good replication of the pillar structure, as you can see on the left, uh, the right hand uh, picture, the microscope, where we definitely see the um, uh, pillar films replicated into the silicone. The very last step, next slide please, was in fact to test the um, efficiency of this product in on in real life application and that uh, will be explained by our partner um, Danaos. Fotis will present you everything about uh, this application. Thanks a lot. Thank you Alain. Thank you for this nice introduction to the uh, air code foil. Uh, we we'll basically go with the details of the container ship demonstration basically follow up on the video that you showed earlier at the beginning of this session. So please, next slide. Uh, first, I'm gonna show you, let's say the demo background uh, where we apply the test patch and what was actually the foil test patch that we applied and adhered to the hull of the vessel. Next slide, yes. So we basically do the application in Romania in a dry docking on, in one of our uh, container ship of the Naos container ship. The container ship was uh, a mid one, let's say, in size, 6.5 thousand TU, 300 meter long. Um, the air coat was adhered to the fore side of the ship, attached, let's say, close to the section that is near to the both raster of the fore side on the starboard. Uh, for the rest of the hull, in order to check, of course, the compatibility with other uh, uh, application coating scheme, we applied the very conventional paint, the self-polishing low friction coating, coating, a very universal coating. This is actually out in the market, very, very convenient. Next slide, please. Uh, as Len briefed you into before, the industrial um, patch that we applied, uh, it was uh, a black one. Uh, the only uh, difference is that by that time, we didn't have a P protective seat, so we applied and we managed to do that without the protective seat. 
uh, about the size was about 15 square meter on the starboard side, as I said before, and then the orientation was two meter um, vertically from five draft line to seven draft line from bottom up perspective. And four aft uh, about was covering a seven meter uh, uh, line. Uh, total was uh, 15 square meter. Next slide. Then I'm going to brief you into the details, let's say, of the procedure to show the steps that we followed in order to prepare the surface, the substrate surface, and to apply the foil. So first, we did the necessary surface preparation and apply the epoxy primers. This was actually took two days. So we blast the hull. Uh, we apply the high pressure first water cleaning to remove any practical. Uh, and we applied two layers of uh, universal epoxy anti corrosive primer with a thickness of 300 micron uh, in order, let's say, to structure the proper anti corrosive layer. Uh, and it was compatible with the low temperature that was expected by that time in Romania because we were in the hard winter. Uh, the equipment and the resources for the epoxy application was a conventional, let's say, list of uh, resources, the airless pump, properly clean, clean hoses and nozzles, of course, a cherry picker and, and a guy actually to be on there and uh, apply uh, uh, the, the paint, the required protecting equipment and some control, let's say, uh, gauzes or sensors for the temperature and humidity and so on and so forth. Then, uh, after, let's say, the drying time, the necessary overcoating interval, we applied the foil itself. We, it took for the 15 square meter one day and pretty much the steps was first to construct, let's say, the, the, the necessary supportive infrastructure, which was actually comprised of a scaffolding in order, let's say, to host the applicator and a tent. Uh, so to have, let's say, some work conditions. Uh, we had three heaters of 15 kilowatt each. That's why, because we needed uh, a minimum temperature of 15 uh, uh, Celsius decrease substrate temperature in order for the foil to be adhered properly, properly uh, against the hull. Uh, so in order to reach that, we used uh, three heaters that were actually active all, all the time. Then we applied the stripes of the foil uh, one after the other in order to see, let's say, the edges of, of the stripe, we applied the proper edge silly system. The job done with successfully with a low with a very very low waste of uh, of uh, material uh in order to progress the adhesion for the remaining time until the vessel got, got back in the water we remain the heater active to remain this warm condition and the tent on and we could conclude let's say the the application very very successfully next slide please uh, we didn't have faced any critical issues apart from the usual delays that they always expected in a dry dock COVID-19 was another issue that prevented some of the uh, people, of the airport people, to be very attentive. Nevertheless, we have accomplished our uh, work without any critical, let's say, risk uh, and, doing, and doing that properly within time. And the only critical risk that we need to face was the low temperature that was very, very hard winter, as I said before, in Romania. So we needed to, to, to retain, let's say, uh, constantly a, a, a temperature of above, let's say, 7 uh, Celsius degrees. And so we had the heater shown and the protective uh, uh, tent in order to keep the work condition before uh, uh, the vessel go back into water. Next slide. This is a snapshot of some photos, beginning, let's say, with the vessel, with a snapshot of the vessel in the dry dock. The stripes has been applied against the hull. Uh, and concluding in the uh, lower, let's say, row, uh, the right uh, as you see the screen uh, uh, corner with the foil submerged back into water as the vessel would flood it into the dry dock. Next slide. I will conclude, let's say, my presentation we have on, on the plan that we that we're going to want to follow to monitor, let's say, the foil as it is attached on the vessel and how we're going to evaluate the benefits. So next slide, please. Uh, in order to monitor the condition of the foil, we will do some kind of Underwater inspection, we've been planned to do one or two, and some harbor visit if the draft line allows us to see, let's say, the upper, la the upper layers of the, of the foil, if it's close to the water line, and take some pictures from the dock. The, the list of criteria that are going to evaluate in order to judge the feasibility of a large scale application and, uh, and judge, let's say, the relevant benefits that we anticipate from their code technology is the time of application in the dry dock, the cost of application, the waste 
uh, produced during the application, the development, of course, of uh, marine growth, so the, the anti-fouling, the biofouling uh, properties, uh, durability and adhesion of soil after service, the retention, which is actually the proper principle that we investigate in this technology, drug reduction and performance. This is going to be a, a, a fully judged from a simulation, a CFDs. Maintenance, damage and repair, so how much we should actually uh, uh, take any kind of action in order, between intervals in order to maintain properly the application. And the final slide is the path that we need to follow in order to validate the technology. First, we're going to gather some data, data that we will be captured from photos uh, during the underwater inspection or the harbor visit. We will correlate it, this data with uh, further studies as based on the simulation, which will predict the performance of a fully coded to code NRC based on friction data that we're going to took from experiments uh, in model vessels. Uh, uh, we're going to compare all this with historical data for the reference vessel that we apply these test pads in order to judge, let's say, and estimate the value and, the, and evaluate the technology advances to have as a case study as a reference, let's say, vessel. We will perform uh, some kind of uh, uh, series, let's say, of studies that uh, range from cost-benefit analysis, life cycle analysis, or even risk analysis, in order to assess both the economic and the environmental availability of the of our full-scale application of our technology. And now, in order to reach, let's say, our ultimate goal, which is to validate and quantify the benefits of a full-scale air code solution, so we're going to judge, let's say, the readiness. Of, uh, of our product in the market against the defined KPIs, which is friction reduction, fuel savings, anti fouling properties, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to do that in an iterative way. So we're going to create a plan in order to define, let's say, how we'll monitor the foil patch, even after the project completion, should we have, let's say, a continuous feedback, feedback loop uh, and conclude, let's say, with the proper, uh, 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 how can I say that? with the proper, let's say, validation of our technology and just the readiness in order to be introduced into the market. It is actually with this comment, I conclude my presentation and I'm passing the floor to Nils from CML. Thanks, Fotis, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Nils Hagemeister. I'm a research associate with Fraunhofer CML in Hamburg, and I'm going to uh, introduce our method for performance prediction. Um, so at the beginning of the project, we basically looked at three different options uh, to validate the performance of air code at full scale. The first one uh, was a full scale ship trial, um, which seems quite straightforward, but it was discarded very quickly because of the amount of material that we would have to produce and the fact that we would have to apply it manually. The second option uh, we saw was using and potentially modifying an existing performance prediction method. These methods are well established. Uh, however, uh, we weren't quite sure how to modify it, uh, especially since most of these methods rely on some sort of scaling to the uh, actual flow conditions. So uh, we settled for the third option, which was to do a simulation with computational fluid dynamics. Uh, this has the advantage of being in full scale, so no scaling involved, and it's an actual modeling of the flow. Um, we did have to do some adaptions. Uh, so in this case, the uh, HSB from Bremen, they developed a wall function to model the effect of air code, um, yeah, which made it possible to um, yeah, discard the first two options and settle for the CFD option. Uh, next slide, please. Um, before I go into detail on that. I want to uh, present some general considerations on the performance prediction. So the first is the dependence of drag reduction and air retention on the size of the structures, which is shown qualitatively in the left plot. Uh, so drag reduction increases with the size of the structure. However, the air retention capabilities decrease with the size of the structure. And the other consideration I want to point out is um, yeah, shown on the in the plot on the right. Uh, in blue, you see plotted the ratio of uh, frictional to total resistance over speed. And in orange, you see the, the progression of the uh, fr absolute frictional resistance with speed. And what you can see is that the, the share of frictional resistance is relatively high at low speeds. However, in absolute terms, um, the frictional resistance is highest 
at, at high speeds. Uh, so this means in relative terms, uh, we would expect uh, larger gains from air cooled at low speeds. Um, and in absolute terms, we would expect uh, larger gains at high speeds. Um, next slide. Um, so the example uh, which we used uh, to run our simulations uh, is the Korean container ship, um, which is a well-established test case. It's a ship of lengths of 230 meters, and the velocity uh, shown in this example is 26.6 knots, and the structure size we selected was 50 micrometers. Next slide, please. And the results uh, we found are shown in this plot. So for the uncoated vessel, uh, we found a total resistance of about 2.3 mega newtons, uh, which was about equally shared uh, between pressure resistance and frictional resistance. And for the vessel coated with air coat, um, the total resistance was reduced to about 2.26 mega newtons. Um, the pressure resistance actually increased slightly. However, the frictional resistance was re reduced by about 62 kilonewtons. Uh, in terms of percentages, um, the total resistance was reduced by about 2.5% and the frictional resistance by about 5.3%. Next slide, please. Um, and to, to better show how the air code uh, works, we've created this plot where you can see um, the wall shear stress of the uncoated vessel at, on the top half and the wall shear stress or friction of the uh, vessel coated with air coat on the bottom half. And um, blue colors indicate low friction and red colors indicate high friction. And what you can see is that in general, the friction is um, high at the front of the ship and then decreases um, towards the, the end of the ship while the flow passes along. Um, so you see the, the lowest wall shear stress just in front of the transom. Um, if you look closely, what you can also see is um, that the ship with air coat experiences slightly lower wall shear stress. And this is especially evident in the forward part of the ship, um, where the relatively large red area of the uncoated ship um, yeah, is a little bit less red and tends more towards the, the gray scale in the vessel coated with air coat. Um, next slide, please. And to um, yeah, show this a little bit better, um, we've created a plot uh, where we plotted the difference in wall shear stress. So we subtracted, subtracted one um, result from the other. And uh, this is the result of that. And you can see that, um, especially in the, in the forward part of the ship, um, so now red indicating a large difference in wall shear stress, um, the friction was reduced quite a lot. And in areas where there was a um, very low shear stress to start with, there's also not much difference to be found, uh, like just in front of the transom. So next slide, please. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we have developed and shown a method for resistance prediction of uh, single vessels with air coat. Um, we expect relatively higher gains at lower velocities because the share of the frictional resistance uh, from the total is higher. However, in absolute terms, um, yeah, the gains will be higher at higher speeds. Um, we've seen a small increase in pressure resistance, uh, which we attribute to the fact that the loss of momentum uh, as the flow passes the ship is a little bit smaller, so which leads to higher velocities at the back of the ship, um, which increases, uh, which decreases the pressure. And uh, for the same reason, we also expect a slight reduction in propeller, uh, propeller efficiency because the speed in the wake of the ship uh, will be higher. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. And uh, the next speaker uh, will be Yuka Pekka from FMI, who will tell you uh, things about the, the global impact of air code. OK, thank you, Nils. I'm Jukka Pekka Jalkanen. I work as a senior researcher at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. So my talk will introduce to you the tools that we have used to model the effects of air coat at the global level. So next slide, please. The air coat foil can have several useful contributions. So they range from drag reduction to the reduction of fuel consumption and air emissions, but also reducing the um, need for antifouling paints. 
and dampening the machinery noise of ships which resonate through the hull. I'm going to address the air emissions and fuel savings in this talk. So not the image on the right side. Uh, this includes a structured surface with uh, 50 micrometer pillars. So the human hair is about 70 micro, uh, microns in diameter. And we're talking about pillars which are about the same size as the thickness of the human hair. So next slide, please. So our aim in air code was to provide tools for quantifying the air code effect when the foil is applied to the global fleet. So the approach chosen for these tasks started from computational fluid dynamic studies made by the Bremen Group. And these findings were then transferred to the ship traffic emission assessment model, which we developed at the FMI. So this meant that we linked the microscopic scale of CFD with the macroscopic modeling of ships or a fleet of ships in steam. So also partial coverage cases were considered, which means that if the air coat foil covers only the part of the hull, so we could also provide an estimate of the performance for any ship in the global fleet. The image on this slide gives you an idea of this kind of partial foil coverage case. The red represents the foil and it is applied down from the waterline um, along the steel hull of the ship. So next slide, please. So a few words about the approach and the tools which were used in this work. We use data from Automatic Identification System or AIS, and that provides a frequent update of vessel positions at a global level. Both satellite and terrestrial AIS were used in this work, and the data comes from year 2018. An example of AIS snapshot from a few days back can be seen on the bottom right. So this is from Marine Traffic website. In addition to the global fleet, technical description was obtained from IHS market. So these data include physical dimensions, machinery details, cargo capacity description, to name a few. So the ship activity and the fleet description were combined and fed into the steam ship emission model. So next slide, please. So this slide describes the model processing for air emissions. So the input data sets describing the vessel activity and technical details are here on the top. And the steps described in the slide are repeated over all of the ships and every position report found in the AIS data. So this means that this cycle of events is repeated billions of times during a global simulation. Note that I have marked two boxes with ellipsoids. So the red one uh, is here to remind us that the weather contributions were turned off in this work. So no contributions from wind, waves, sea ice or currents were considered. The yellow ellipsoid indicates the part that was changed by the air code foil. So this is where the friction calculations take place. As a result, we get a printout of vessel level emissions and fuel consumption uh, of the global fleet. So this is how steam works. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like when we combine it to a, to a single image. So this is a map of CO2 emissions from, uh, from global fleet. So we can trace this map back to individual ships and do a vessel level validation against stack measurements uh, or fuel reports. So next slide, please. So during this work, we also had a look at the wet surface area of the global fleet. So the bar graph on the left indicates the draft distribution of the global fleet of ships. So as you can see, most of the wet surface is on ships which have a draft between 14 and 15 meters. So their contribution is already over 40 million square meters. So the line indicates a cumulative fraction of the wet surface covered. So from this figure, you can see that the, about 50% of the fleet uh, wet surface, it can be covered uh, if we apply air code to vessels up to 13 meters of draft. So the figure on the right describes the situation where the first five meters down from the waterline are covered with the foil. So some ship types are already almost completely covered by the foil if we use this five, first five meters like yachts, ferry boats, and high-speed craft. So however, for some vessel types, like the crude oil tankers, the first five meters represents only a small fraction of the wet surface of the ship type. So next slide, please. So it should be noted that the performance prediction used in this work involves calculations which estimate the frictional and residu residual resistance components separately. So on the left, we have a pie chart 
which plots the energy use of a ship in a simplistic manner. So this is just the view on the estimated fuel consumption of the global fleet, looking at the global totals. So from this, you can see that the fuel used for propulsion is about three quarters of the total fuel consumption. So the remaining quarter is used in auxiliary engines and boilers, which generate electricity and heat for ships. So if we further split the propulsion fuel use to frictional and residual resistant components, it can be seen that the fuel used to overcome friction is about half of the propulsion fuel. So from this pie chart, you can see that if we completely eliminate friction, it may lead to uh, about savings of 40% in the, in the shipping fuel. So in this figure, it means that this orange part here is reduced. And on the right hand side, we have a more detailed description of energy flows uh, of a cruise vessel. So as you can see, there are many components in the energy balance and the propulsion is only a part of it. Next slide, please. So this slide provides one example of the results which can be obtained with the models. So it is a summary of results for this 50 micrometer pillar surface case, which was described in one of the first slides of this talk. So for this surface structure, the maximum reduction with the full application of air code is about 2% less CO2 emitted and fuel used. So almost 3% less particulates are emitted. So of course, if the foil does not cover all of the wet surface of the fleet, then the savings will, will be less than this. On the right side, uh, there are examples for a single Ropax vessel on the top image and for the global fleet on the bottom. So for this example vessel, the estimated annual savings will be around 150,000 euros per year if the first five meters of the wet surface down from the waterline is covered with the foil. Note that these numbers will change if uh, slow steaming is applied, since the friction reduction is speed dependent. This approach that presented in this talk it can also be applied to those cases. So I must stress here that if we change the surface structure, make the small pillars, make them taller or wider, then these calculations need to be rerun. The point of this exercise is to show that uh, we now have the tools which link the advanced studies of microstructured surfaces with the global fleet modeling. This can be used to test various structures before they are taken through the manufacturing. Next slide, please. So there are four take home messages from this talk. The first one is that the reduction of around 40% in ship fuel consumption can be achieved if we completely eliminate the friction. So if you eliminate half of the friction, then the total fuel consumption goes down by 20%, not more. The second and the third points to remember are that we now have the tools to predict the fleet fuel savings as a function of microscopic surface structure. So this links the CFD studies with the steam modeling, and it also considers speed changes or slow steaming. Since drag reduction mechanism that was built in these models, it is speed dependent. And finally, all predictions are done at vessel level, and we can go from single ships to fleet level quite easily. So the modeling tools may speed up the surface design process before the manufacturing step is taken. And with this, I would like to stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers, uh, namely there were Helen, Fotis, Yuka Pekka and Niels. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah, I'm no longer alone here on that virtual stage. Back with me are the speakers that just presented. We're uh, again happy if you have any questions, we would like to answer them. So please, if you have any questions or comments, post them in the chat as before. We're now going to discuss the development and application. We're going to um, take a closer look at the friction reduction, which uh, already brings me back to the question that we have in session one that was uh, came up really at the end of the of the session. Um, Elias Lieberman, he wanted to know about the experimental results because he took a closer look and he noticed that there was a um, drag reduction even without the air layer on the air coat foil. So as you might have learned, it's a really complicated process. There are a lot of dependencies and I would like to um, 
direct this question to Niels. Maybe Niels, you can say something about the um, the effect of drag reduction even without the air. Uh, well, it's uh, I mean always difficult to interpret uh, experimental results. Um, however, in in this case, and I have to say, I, I was not involved in the experiments, uh, so I have to do a little bit of of guessing here. Um, that there might be an an effect um, which is, for example, uh, similar to what riblets are doing, um, so influencing the turbulence on the surface. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, for for me it's it's difficult to answer um, as I I wasn't uh, very deeply involved in this. Okay, no, no. thank you, Newt. Up to this point, uh, I'm wondering if we can get Johannes here on stage. Maybe he can answer it better. Hi. Oh, yeah. there you are. Great, Johannes. <laughs> so I, okay. I hope you heard everything. Uh, maybe yes. you can comment on it. Yeah. So the question was if he read correctly, and yes, he did read correctly. So without the air coat uh, or with the gas um, foil, we received a reduction of about 8 to 12 percent compared to the, um, the friction line um, and as Neil said we are guessing that a similar effect is, such as in riblets are taking place um, however at higher speeds maybe you 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 recall the graph there was a, a blue line which is go about 10 percent or 8 to 12 percent below the black line the reference and then there's this green line which is air code and at higher speeds about Six to um, seven point five, uh, the the air code um, increases. So the the effect of, of air code at higher speeds is up to nine percent, whereas at the same speed, uh, the degassed air code had uh, only an effect of about four percent. So it should have said uh, four to twelve, not eight to twelve percent. So we expect that our um, riblet or our superimposed air we, we expect that our degas um, air coat uh, foil has a, as a fallback solution has an effect, um, but we still need to, to learn about that. Um, but also what you can see at higher speeds, uh, air coat behaves better. Thank you, Johannes, for this uh, further explanation. Um, I hope this answer is Elias. Maybe if not, you can come up with more questions in the chat. Or you can uh, go to the left hand side of your of your um, of your presentation here. Then it says speakers, and maybe you can post a question directly to Johannes. Also, I would like to come back to one other question from Damien de Moor. He was working on a proposal and looking for some air code foil to cover his vessel. Damien, I must say uh, this question might raise some more questions that will come back and forth. So um, I would like to already point out that AirCode is not a commercial product. And we have now seen what happened within the project and how it, uh, AirCode foil is being produced. So my suggestion would be that you get in contact with one of the speakers here and maybe uh, we can come up with a date and further discuss your uh, request and see uh, what you're actually working on. Uh, we would be great to get in contact with you. Thank you. Okay, now officially session two. There was a question about the CFD from Jan Xing Kerding. She wants to know even more about how this uh, whole CFD simulation works. So Niels, what model did you use for your echo estimate and the drag reduction? Um, so we used uh, a Reynolds Aver average Navier-Stokes model, um, and for that we used the custom wall function that was uh, developed uh, by the HSB from Bremen uh, in their work. So basically, they made simulations um, to to develop this wall function, which we then used um, uh, to predict the resistance of a of a full scale ship. Um, so it's it's not a publicly available model at the moment, um, but um, what it does it it does allow some slip basically between the uh, hull of the ship and and the water, um, as opposed to um, using the, the standard non-slip condition. I hope this answers uh, the question. I hope so too. Thank you, Niels. I would like to know from Yuka Pekka, what is the difference in your simulation compared to what Niels did? 
So basically what Niels did was much more detailed because what we do in, uh, in Steam is a very simplistic uh, method of predicting the resistance. So basically what Niels is able to do is much more elaborate. So the benefit of having us to do the global simulation comes to, okay, whatever was developed based on the CFD calculations of crack reduction, so basically defining this dependency of crack reduction, then we can apply that in, uh, in a global fleet simulations. So that's the benefit and the difference that we have. But uh, I must say that CFD is much more detailed than what we do. Thank you, Jukka Pekka. There are multiple questions coming from Andrew Spittery. Um, we will get to it one by one. So the first question is about the drag reduction effect and if we can tell the difference between uh, an effect from the structure and an effect from the air layer. Niels, what are your experience with that in the CFD simulation? Well, in the CFD simulation, we actually don't do not discriminate between those. We are just modeling, let's say, a drag reduction effect on top of the surface and it's kind of yeah it's it's not in our simulation at least it's not connected um to an actual structure or air layer it's just we are modeling the effect that the air layer has on the surface i think that needs to be uh, pointed out here um however um the, the the size of the structure has quite a large effect as was shown earlier uh, this morning um, so we basically if we um, would simulate a smaller structure we would see a smaller drag reduction and vice versa okay thank you Niels so it's a quite complex topic uh, I have to admit it's hard to answer with one question there is a question about the material and the foil. I would like to direct the question to Helen. So has the coating film a shelf life and how can it be manufactured? Maybe you can give a little bit more details about that. And uh, also there is a question about the application, but uh, one after the other. So tell us about the shelf life of your product. So um, the shelf life of the, the product is mostly related to um, the adhesive layer, which is uh, at the back. Uh, you remember it's a multi-layer um, self-adhesive. Um, so as long as the um, the product is stored uh, within um, uh, standard conditions of uh, humidity and temperature, we expect a minimum of two years of shelf life. Um, with what regards the top layer, um, as long as it is stored with uh, its protective sheet, we see no, uh, we expect no change in time of um, the, the performance of the product. So, uh, yeah, count on a minimum of, of two years uh, shelf life for the product, final product. Thank you, Alain. About the application, I think, Fotis, uh, you were there, you're the expert on the application. Maybe you can say something about the different difficulties and also the time frame and other um, conditions that you need for a good application process. Uh, yeah, um, the difficulties. Um, the difficulties actually was narrowed down to the critical factor, as I said in my presentation, about the, the low temperature. We need at least with the material that we applied a uh, low temperature let's say of uh sorry at minimum temperature of 15 session degrees of uh, substrate uh so when would you do that in winter time with uh, harsh condition and low temperature you need actually to compensate and mitigate with an infrastructure let's say that was the heaters um this creates some you know cost consideration because you have the heater zone you have you need power yeah uh, and maybe you increase let's say the cost of the installation so uh you need actually to see how you compensate that when you go to the savings that when you apply let's say when you have the, the vessel in service and you achieve some uh full reduction so you need to compensate for this increase let's say cost uh but again apart from this um it was a quite straightforward application another threat uh, another difficulty we're gonna go for uh, a few stories about the cat uh it was uh, that happens in life uh, it's a classic home uh, office yeah common a common you know <laughs> anyway uh because uh we, if you're gonna go for full scale we attach let's say a 15 square meter test pads if you're gonna fall for full scale uh you need to decrease let's say the time 
because if you need one one day for 15, imagine how you need for 10,000, let's say, square meters of hull uh, surface. So we investigated. This is something that we did for in similar projects, some robotics application or automation processes to decrease, let's say, the time of application, which is quite critical when you deal with a certain, let's say, time windows in uh, dry talking periods. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Fotis. Um, I would like to ask Thomas, what is the difference between the foil that you produce at KIT and the foil that was produced by Avery Dennison? I'm sorry, Thomas, you have to unmute your mic. Uh, it's on. Okay, now we can hear you. Yeah, it's on. So actually, there's no difference. It's from the water side, it's the same foil. Uh, the structures keeping the air are produced at KIT. Uh, the backside, bringing it as a self-adhesive foil uh, onto the ship, is produced by Avery Dennison. So our front side is put together with a back self-adhesive backside of Avery Dennison, and together it gives uh, the uh, product which uh, we put onto the boat or the ship. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Then um, maybe we can come back to a question that was raised before about the drag reduction. And there were multiple values for drag reduction and how effective it is and what is the actual f uh, fuel consumption with and without air code. Maybe you can pack it. You can, you have a good overview on how much a vessel can save. Maybe you can say something about there. Um, there was also the example in session four for uh, for a 10 meter draft and 30 knots uh, traveling speed. So what is your, your evaluation on that? Yeah, as, as you noticed that there are a lot of variables in this. So it varies from vessel to vessel. So if, if you have a, uh, a shallow draft vessel with a high speed, then uh, you would expect larger savings. But if you can, if you partially coat an oil tanker with air coat, you don't see that much of an effect. So uh, the um, uh, slides that I showed in my presentation, so those were kind of overall effect at the from a global fleet level. But of course, we can choose any, any of the vessels in the global fleet. So previously, there was a question about this, uh, or what I was assuming to be a cargo ship. So you would have a 10 meter draft with 13 knots of speed. So that would be a kind of an um, I duck up a bulk carrier with these specifications. So if you fully coat that one with air coat, so you would save about 2% of the uh, total fuel consumption per year. So this would be uh, the estimated effect for that vessel. Thank you, Yuka Pekka. I would like to come back to the process of application. Photos we saw in the video that the application was done by hand and also in the video before at the research vessel. Uh, what other methods are there to apply air code foil on a vessel? Yeah, as I said in my previous answer, we should see um, methods as automated processes. I mean, the technology is out there for robotics. We There are robotics in the business for doing inspections, close-up surveys, and these kind of things. Uh, I think it's tangible, and uh, I can see only that option. I mean, for uh, for a full scale, even going to go to apply product tomorrow in large ships. Uh, so yeah, robotics and automation processes is something that we should uh, investigate, and this is actually an alternative, a good alternative. Yes, yeah, so it's an ongoing process. Thank you, Fotis. <laughs> Helen, you produced the air code uh, foil on a large scale. And the question that we often get is, um, how much would you charge for such a foil? Have you any <laughs> estimate of what perhaps one square meter of the foil would cost if it at some point will be commercially available? Um, so it's a little bit difficult to answer because we have already um, uh, still so many variables um, that we would need to set. But um, at the moment, with the, the conditions of uh, productions, that would be a foil of uh, um, a few, uh, several tens of euros per square meter, um, for sure. And uh, But industrialized, 
industrialization would lead to uh, cost reduction with time because uh, yeah, when parameters are better set, there's less crap, uh, better production efficiency. Um, so, um, um, but um, yeah, it's not um, a, a product which will cost uh, 50 cents uh, uh, per square meter like um, some other self adhesives. Thank you, Alain. Nils, I would uh, like to come back to your presentation. So you presented some results that there are some pressure differences when applying the air coat foil. You also, uh, on a private level, you like to sail a boat. So I would like to ask, um, what is your expectation or what do you expect the performance of the air coat? Will you feel a difference in maneuvering or steering a vessel when air coat foil is applied? Um, so you probably mean uh, concerning turning circles or or maybe Stop other that exactly yes okay so um, if you look at for example uh, an, an emergency stop maneuver um, then obviously with less resistance it might take a little longer um, just because you have less uh, force mm -hmm. holding you back to start with and also over the the full range um, concerning like a, a turning circle um i w i don't think that that friction has a or a reduction a small reduction in friction has a major impact uh on the turning circle or maneuvering properties of a ship um okay. just because yeah if, if you have a, a friction is, is not the the only um force that the ship experiences especially not if you go in a turning circle and so you're only changing a small part of the total force and thereby i would say um you might be able in some edge cases to to feel it but i don't think it will have a huge impact thank you niels Yuka Pekka, you were mentioning savings for one vessel that you have an example for and you estimated some number. So what can we expect from other vessels? Do you have a feeling or an idea about it? Is there a rule of thumb that you can maybe apply on the savings for a vessel? Well, I, uh, if I could predict the oil price, I would be a very wealthy man. But uh, uh, let's say that... Uh, the volatility that you have in, in in the fuel prices is already quite difficult to uh, say but uh, but um let's put it this way that the, uh, the amount of fuel that you will save with the foil it depends on how you operate the vessel also if the foil performance is maintained over several years so that you don't have to do replace it uh, frequently so all of these come into this play so basically it would have to be a very careful evaluation on the um, on the fuel fuel savings but also uh, the thing that i did not list in my numbers was for example i did not consider any kind of savings for the anti-fouling part or things like these so it would be very uh, long list of variables that need to be included so in that sense we would have to think about very carefully uh, in this economics part of the foil in that in that regard okay thank you yuka pekka i will just take a closer look here in the chat there were several questions popping up so okay this is hard to read i'm sorry mm. okay so there is a question by philip beverage and um, he wants to know about the cleaning of the microstructure and the recovering if of the performance once it was lost maybe thomas you can answer that so what is what are the possibilities to to actually clean the air coat foil and will it re, will it regain its performance after it maybe was once lost well uh cleaning is a key point of course uh, seawater will not be clear and uh, so we decided not to take the complex structure of the sylvania plant which is liable of uh, including particles from the sea, but we had clear pillars, so washing out uh, potential uh, particles should be very uh, easy. So we do not expect uh, problems of, clean, uh, of cleaning, especially as microfouling, as we saw, uh, is indicated to be prevented uh, by the air layer. 
what happens when the air layer is lost? So I said uh, there's an internal life of the air layer under lab conditions, as I showed with superhydrophobic surfaces. What would happen under rough sea conditions? So the nice thing is that there's a continuous equilibrium between the air stored in the seawater. Seawater is containing air, it's dissolved there. So basically, uh, the seawater is the second largest air uh, uh, deposit in our world. The largest is the ambient air, but the sea is full of air. And what we see is when air is partially lost, uh, the air layer is breathing. If we go to too much depth, then the air layer is lost uh, because the equilibrium is not reached and we have to make smaller structures. But if we are at adequate height, then if we press or do something so that the air layer is, say, only 50%, then it, uh, it breathes, it reassembles the air diffusing in from the water. That's something we saw very clearly at the HSVA experiments when we worked with oversaturated water. Uh, the uh, air layer was recharged so much that bubbles came out. Of course, in real sea conditions, we will not have oversaturated, but just saturated water. But there, a partial loss of air is replenished again by diffusing of air molecules from the water to the air layer. That's, I think, a very important uh, thing we learned uh, during our experiments. Thank you, Thomas. That was a more scientific approach to, to answer the question. Maybe, Helen, can you give your give your evaluation from an industry point? Yeah, so we didn't uh, actually carry out some cleaning tests on the, on the pillar structure, but one point which can be added to what Thomas just mentioned is um, uh, the, the nature of the pillars. So as, as um, explained before, um, during the presentation, we worked with um, silicon uh, pillars, which are uh, very hydrophobic, and they have this filing release ability. And uh, from previous um, uh, experiments done on um, uh, filing of uh, such silicon surfaces, uh, it was demonstrated that uh, filing can occur. Uh, for example, smooth silicon surface filing can occur, but as soon as there is a little bit of friction with water, the filing detaches by itself uh, because of this very um, low surface tension of the um, silicon layer. So uh, uh, normally filing will not occur uh, when the, the air layer is there, um, but if it happens, um, the air layer is destroyed, the, uh, the silicon nature will help um, uh, getting rid of the, of the filing. Thank you, Alain. Philip, I hope this answers your question. We are almost done with this Q&A session number two. Uh, if you have a question, you can still post it in the chat. And I would kind of like to uh, get to the question by Andrew Spittery. He wants to know if the coating product has been qualified or classified as a new technology for maritime applications, or if we have, if we have uh, planned something like that. So maybe I think Thomas, you can you can say something about the product itself and and how you're trying uh, to save it. Well, uh, the, all the specifications um, for a product for maritime applications still have to be done. But what is clear, uh, we do not use a new material. We use materials which are well, uh, people are well familiar, which are well in use for years uh, in maritime applications. So we do not doubt that there will be any problems. I think it's just a formal process. But the, for example, the fouling release materials from PPG, they are non-toxic. They are well established and well approved for maritime applications. Indeed. Thank you, Thomas. Toxic materials throughout our processes. So we do not expect uh, any problems. Thank you for that evaluation. One last question to Fotis. You were mentioning that you would have a revisit and uh, take a look at the air code patch. Has this, uh, has this happened already? So what is the update on the container vessel? Yeah, um, we had an attempt from Niels, which is actually present here, but we were unlucky. 
Um, we would plan to redo that uh, to visit uh, uh, the vessel where, where, when it's at the dock. Maybe we've got the chance to actually take some pictures from above, from the shore. But again, we should do, uh, and as I said, some underwater inspection to have a close-up, let's say, um, uh, survey of the conditions that of, of, the, of the foil, take some pictures and create, let's say, some assessment on top of that on how is the other condition, if it's adhered, if there's any damage. We, we will perform that in, in April, just before the end, let's say, of the project. Thank you, Fotis. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for answering the question. I hope everybody in the audience was happy with our answers. If you would like to um, know more, we will be happy to meet you at the networking sessions later on. The final event is almost over, but just almost. Um, I would like to say thank you to all of you for participating. And um, I'm out from here, but I will leave the stage to Johannes, who will have some final words to you. Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, in this session. So, conclusion, yeah. What have we done? First, I'd like to go into the project results. We conducted the first ever demonstrator project on passive air lubrication. We've uh, learned a lot. We gained a lot of knowledge. Uh, we produced large pieces, in fact, kilometer sizes of microstructures, high quality for. Uh, we defined industrial manufacturing and application processes, and we demonstrated uh, the durability, the operationality of the, of, of the air coat uh, foil, the material strengths of the safety of foil. We showed that drag reduction um, occurs on near operational scales, and we validated it numerically. And we also showed an inhibition of microfouling settlement to, uh, to, to the um, passive air lubrication foil. Um, yeah, we upscaled our results to full scales via simulation and showed the environmental effect. Um, but of course, uh, we understood that there are still uh, some challenges yet to overcome, such as establishing constant retention, air retention, understanding the direct reduction in different environments, the effect of the superimposed air layer, the degassed foils um, to, yeah, validate fuel reduction experimentally and to research about refilling strategies and also um, in terms of the application, developing autonomous automated uh, application method. Um, but that's good. We are, um, that means we can continue. So what's next? Um, we are already working on a small project um, applying the air code on, on the host sector, which is called AirTube. We are compiling public funded uh, follow-up project proposals. And we're also planning a couple of joint industry projects to um, yeah, bring the aircraft closer to market majority. And here uh, we're always open for partnering. So talk to us if you're interested. And of course, we are working on publications and patents. Um, the aircraft website stays open. Um, so information will be posted there. And um, with that, I'd like to uh, thank, first of all, the European Commission for funding this project. And in particular, I'd like to thank Georges Charampoulos, our project officer, uh, for his support during the past four years. I'd like to thank the entire consortium for the great work that was done. Um, I'd like to thank my team here at CML for really professional teamwork on coordinating this, especially Jonathan, Niels, and Christoph. And a special thanks today goes to Clemence from Revolve, who is organizing this event. You didn't see her, but she was busy in the background. And of course, all speakers and uh, session leads of today's uh, event. And in the name of the consortium, I thank all of you, all participants today, and everyone reaching out to us uh, during the course of the past four-year project. Um, it's been inspiring receiving all the knowledgeable feedback and um, yeah, let's keep it going and let's tie on right here in our networking session. So um, with this, I'd like to, to close the final event and open the door for the networking session. Therefore, click on the tab to your left saying networking and connect to one of the tables um, and you can switch between tables and talk to us. So having said that, I'd like to Thank all of you very much in the name of the consortium for tuning on. Bye.